Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Before we get into it, I think there's 25 of these badass cleared hot flannels that are left in uh, some sweatshirts as well. There's a link directly in the show notes that'll take you right there. And before the episode, of course, let's talk about the brand that makes this all possible. That is correct. Black Rifle Coffee. Going to their website right now, Fool's Gold, a medium roast with Irish cream flavoring in it. I feel like I have had this, but there's also a chance that I haven't. I bet you it's pretty good because I feel like they do this every single year. That's all they have on their rotating banner for right now. I think St. Patrick's Day is around the corner. I'm not so great with the months or actually keeping track of what day I'm in. So let's assume that that's coming. And if you want to get some of that, you can shop right now. Right underneath that is this slider that will take you all the way from their lightest to darkest roast. And you can kind of pick what you want. Each one of them, if you let's say I'll click on the Just Black Roast, it has all of the flavor notes that you could possibly want. Um, you can choose a 14-day delivery, a 21-day, a 30-day, every 60, ground or whole bean, one bag, two bag, three bag, four bag, a lot of options that you have for each of those. So you could read about each of those coffees, and those are the options you're going to get for delivery and quantity. Apparel, gear, I talk about those things often. Gear, you know, I might have a little bit too much. I might have a gear problem when it comes to making coffee. Coffee bundles and coffee samplers, these are great for starting people off. And then the bottom is their best sellers. So they are the ones that actually make this podcast possible. I love the people that founded it. I'm a supporter of the brand. And that's all I have on that. My guest today, man, this is a heavy episode. I believe his initial email was titled to me, I euthanized my mom. And we get into that into the episode. His name is Scott Tatum. And I'm going to read the stats in front of me. 35 years in medicine, 25 of those as a rotor wing nurse slash medic. I believe he said on the show he had 600, somewhere between 600 to 650 flights. When you hear that, think life flight, which they don't launch for a fender bender. Uh, currently working for U.S. Border uh, Customs and Border Protection, Air and Marine Operations as a tactic instructor, and for the past eight years, a TAC Med team leader for SWAT and Bomb Squad with Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office. Maintains 23 certifications and still is an instructor with most of them. We talked a lot about that. We talked a lot about some of the calls that he went on, the impact that those calls can have, and of course, about what happened with his mother. So episode number 325 with Scott Tatum. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Michael, I need you to go to YouTube okay. and put in Florida Acorn Cop. <laughs> oh, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Here we go. People need to see this. They need to be aware of this. And we need some audio on this, too, yeah, because it's almost on. the things that are said that are better. M make sure you back it up, too, before the excitement. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah, just play the fucker. I'm going to do a full search. I like this. This is character and plot development right here. Notice there's a tree above his car. <laughs> With an overhanging branch. <laughs> Wait for it. Combat roll. Combat roll. <laughs> Hit pause, Michael. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> pause is not working. Hit. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Back it up just a touch. I want to talk about uh, Fields of Fire. Briefly here. Okay. A little bit forward. Get ready. Right. Not yet. Yeah, that's fine. Right there. Okay. Just to the left of the rear fender, you see another officer in black, which is essentially almost... I mean, I'm going to call that, if you were to do this on a range, there'd be fucking whistles blowing. There would be RSOs, range safety officers, tackling you. It's a tactic 
All right. I'm not going to say it's a good one. <laughs> no, it is no. a tactic. Let's let this play out because I love. I, I'm not going to say it. Yeah, let's just fucking get some. <laughs> Slide lock. Dump the mag. That's gear drift. And he's dealing with his gunshot wound right now that he's trying to figure out where he shot at, which doesn't exist. I think right about here, he started to go, fuck. <laughs> That's far enough, Michael. There's a few things. Like, let's just leave our pistol there at slide lock, not mm -hmm. reload our primary weapon system. And I... And I I don't know anything about this situation other than what I've watched on YouTube about a hundred times. I think at that moment, that might have been the moment where the world started coming back to him and he was realizing potentially what the future might hold. <laughs> so maybe it was actually better that he left the pistol at slide lock. Did he ever pick it back up? I don't know because the exciting part of the video for me had already occurred, so I didn't watch <laughs> the remainder of it. I do know. Well, actually, I can't say I know with any level of certainty. I'd heard that the individual... Uh, quit right after that to he avoid did. an investigation, which I don't think that actually avoids the investigation. <laughs> it does not nil and void what just happened, no. Yeah. Um, I mean, you work around these people sometimes. You're wearing a thin blue line hat on there. Uh -huh. Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I train federal agents, too, and, <clears throat> and local law enforcement, and that's just a mess. That's a cluster. Yeah. I, he didn't... Uh, Know your backdrop. I mean, there's an apartment complex right behind him. Yeah. So where those rounds went, he's got to count for every single one of those rounds. I didn't count the rounds, but how many holes were in a car versus how many weren't? I mean, his magazine was empty when it dropped out, so they're probably carrying 15 plus one. Yeah. So there's that. Plus the three from the sergeant who shot from the other angle. Who was responding and assisting mm -hmm. her partner. I have less of a... There's not really a whole lot you can critique with her. She was trying to support. See, I'm, I'm a grant. Yeah. Totally agree. Yep. Officer calling shots fired. Who is, I might've thought it was a little odd that he was shooting at his own cop car. I mean, there's that. Um, but again, she was responding, trying to help that officer. So there's, I mean, there's that aspect of it, but yeah, every one of those rounds that left the muzzle at hundreds, if not thousands of feet per second impacted somewhere. Uh huh. Michael, can you look up? I have heard that he was a green beret officer. Uh, yeah, I'll see if I can find it. Find everything you can. Name, date of birth, <laughs> home address, contact information. Yeah. And here it comes. Well, anything that's coming is going to be coming because of that video. Not obviously, even if I had those things, I wouldn't release them. But uh, I can't even imagine what their PR phone line is. Their um, public information officer is probably going decline, decline, decline. Have decline. you ever seen videos from like Hawaii where... Um, volcanoes are erupting mm -hmm. and the magma <laughs> is rolling down. Uh -huh. That might look like the handset uh -huh. of the PR. And there's nothing that they can do. They're going to have to weather the storm. Uh, they are going to have to do an investigation. Um, and what yeah. are they going to pull? They're going to pull train records. They are. And I'd also be really curious about the call that he was responding to because that particular individual was so wound up that – and for people who maybe didn't see that or didn't hear me say that you should Google Florida Acorn and Cop – the information that is coming out is that you can see as he's walking to a car, there's a tree with an overhanging branch. And they, what has been reported is that an acorn hit the top of his car, and that is what initiated all of those actions. And then he started shooting. So I'd, I'd be curious to see. You know what I also would like to see? The record of calls that he had re responded to earlier that day or in the days prior. Yeah, yeah, because exactly. It's, it's bizarre behavior to scream that you're hit when you're not is a little bit bizarre to me. Uh, tough job. Well, the story got a little bit more weird because it was he was told that they thought they thought they saw a suppressor sticking out of his pants. So he went back to the out patrol of the car. Person in the yeah. When they patrol. search before putting in the car, and that was my theory. He went back to the car to search him again. And they thought he would missed it. Wouldn't they also be handcuffed? Yes. I mean, I know people can should be cuffs. handcuffed in the back. Yeah, they can, and they can slip handcuffs. Mm -hmm. I may or may not watch it substantial amount of uh, body cam footage on YouTube for my own personal. <laughs> Same. First off, people are way more flexible than you would think. Women mm -hmm. seem to be able to slip out of cuffs like nobody's business, mm -hmm. but it's certainly not a guarantee that their hands are still going to be cuffed behind their back. No, no. Yeah. Well, and the, the sound of suppressor inside of a car is still not quiet. I mean, it's going to be louder than what an acorn sounds like. You also would have heard glass. 
you know, that's there, true. there yeah. are indication. Was it a supersonic round, a subsonic round? I mean, it's true. Yeah. I don't know. The whole thing lot. was, I, the sergeant I'm with you on that, cause she was responding to, I've been shot and she's shooting and while he's shooting returning fire. Right. Yeah. Well, what did I miss? So I need to help out. But she stopped after three rounds and went, whoa, whoa, something's weird here. Well, she was shooting at a cop car. So, <laughs> Michael, what did you find? <laughs> then there's uh, I can't find anywhere it says he was a Green Beret officer. And what I think can you find? Basically, just the story. Give us the wave tops. Are we correct in our assessment? Acorn um, on the... <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it was an acorn. Well, most likely an acorn. Uh, apparently, the female officer after asked acorn, and he goes, yeah, acorn. <laughs> So, <laughs> fuck. Well, there's good and bad in every profession, right? Here we are. It's a profession that is uh, staffed by human beings, and I get it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to say I've ever been ambushed by an acorn, <laughs> but you know, the memes are going to be incredible. Oh, they already are. They are increasing in velocity at a nonlinear rate as well. Okay, so, I need to download them. Um. They'll find their way to you. <laughs> yeah. If you look at the, <laughs> they will. the right curated social media feed, they'll find their way right to you. I've actually avoided social media for five years. Okay. I've gotten off it. After you, the Jordan. You were on it and then you got off? Yeah. Yeah. Most freeing thing I ever did. Did it feel when you first got off of it, uh, was there almost like uh, kicking an addiction? Like It was like withdrawals. Yeah. 100%. Trying to, you like, oh, you reach for it, mm -hmm. but you realize it's not, you don't want to do that. You had already taken yeah. it off. Now my, I find myself doing that with YouTube now. I'm like, oh, I'm starting to feel this need to, to look at YouTube shorts, you know, and scroll through. And all of a sudden yeah. I'll look up and I've been doing it for an hour. Isn't it amazing how fast the time flies? Yes. Yes. It's scary because I don't like the feeling of being addicted to something. Yeah. You know? So it was uh, the George Floyd incident <clears throat> that got you to go off social yep. media? Yep. Right up there. We did four days of riots in Oklahoma City. Um, we Where did he die? Was it? In, it was not. In no, it, was it but yet? the riots went nationwide. Right, so they were hitting us. They were wanting to go after the jail, so we were guarding the jail and trying to protect the inmates. But they were, yeah, we had four days of riots. They were trying to get people out of the jail. Rumor has it they wanted to burn it, so we couldn't exactly let that happen legally. They wanted to burn the jail mm -hmm. with the people in it. Yeah, it was kind of <laughs> that is a very tenuous line to draw from what happened with George Floyd to burning a prison with people in it. Yeah, I agree. Okay, you know it was weird during the riots is because we'd have. Like the Mennonites would show up to protest. And I'm like, well, did you park your horse up the road? What are you, what are you protesting about? What does George Floyd have to do with your, the Mennonites? Yeah, they literally showed up with their wagon and in their whole full garb, and they were there to protest too. And the thing I found is humans will follow the person with the megaphone. Doesn't matter. And four days of watching this, I just people watch for four days, right? Yeah. People, I could have grabbed a megaphone and said, hey, the dinosaurs cause all this. And just because I had a megaphone, people would be like, yes, dinosaurs cause this. I was going to ask you, did you interact with anybody at all and actually talk with them about why they were there or what led them to be there? It was because most of them had personal. Some of them were flown in or driven in from out of state. Yeah. Confirmed. They were like, hey, where, do, where is the police department at? We don't even know. Um, they were wanting to go to OCPD's police department, and we were guarding county sheriff's jail. They didn't know where they were at, so it was obvious they weren't from our state. <clears throat> but most of them were just either been arrested or something, and they jumped on the BLM and wanted to, this is their chance to protest. Hmm. And they would meet downtown Oklahoma City, and then they would have a huge parade, and we'd just watch it. Um, eventually, the end of the night, once curfew kicked in, CS gas was deployed. Um, they got to be pretty good, though. They were, it was like a cat and mouse game. They would deploy CS gas, or we would deploy CS gas, and they would drop a traffic cone over it and put a water bottle on the top and totally defeated our CS gas canister. And I was like, that's brilliant. That's not, that's not bad. No. I was like, hats off to you. What was it that eventually quenched that fire and they stopped? It got hot. Really? Yeah. Just They're the environmentals. Somewhat fair weather fair weather protesters i noticed which is that. interesting because if you have true conviction of belief it wouldn't really matter right yeah you, you go no matter what but yeah they got really really hot they got hot they didn't really want to do it anymore and that and ohp had had enough yeah ohp was like yeah we're stopping this and they they play by a little different set of rules okay yeah fair enough fair enough what do you do for your day job Work full time for U.S. Customs Border Protection as a contractor. Mm -hmm. um, I teach tactics, uh, tactical med, um, off duty carry, and 
active shooter response. Off duty so, carry, like literally like everyday carry, concealed mm-hmm. carry, to, to agents or to civilians? To agents. So something that oh, they don't, they get zero training in the police camera on how to draw from concealment, how to carry off duty. Oh, fuck. That makes total sense, actually. Yeah, it's a Because they have limited time to prep them yeah. for their time in uniform. And so we're trying to, we, we teach them how to respond as you're thinking like a cop, but you look like everybody else. Yeah. So you put down the threat, but your next threat is the blue coming because they're responding to a man with a gun. You're that man with a gun. You're in trouble. So you need to know how to. There actually have been a few instances of where uh, bystanders trying to help have been shot. And yes. Killed. So what do you recommend? And this is, I'm actually glad you brought that up because I'm curious what the, the doctrinal answer would be. I mean, best case scenario, you're able to defeat it immediately and identify yourself. Worst case scenario seems like you would get there at the same time and then they're confused as to what threat they're trying to address. So I'm curious how you teach that in the curriculum. So if they do arrive simultaneously, you need to take the action of identifying yourself, but we also tell them don't identify yourself as a federal agent. Nobody hears that and they're looking for, you don't fit that, I'm a cop. Start yelling blue or go submissive until you get established that you're you're a cop. Let them handle it. Let them handle it. Get your gun down, put your hands up like you would of anybody else, and say, hey, I'm a cop, I'm an off-duty cop. And once they process that and kind of get out of that that kind of auto-exclusion that they're responding to, then maybe they can utilize you. But if they show up and you show up with a gun and plain clothes, you're basically the bad guy. What do you recommend for civilians that carry and might find themselves in a situation like this where they don't even have the opportunity to identify themselves as a cop go submissive drop that gun take a knee put your hands in the air let them see hands um it's a quick way to take around i mean yes thank you for putting down the threat but the threat's not over with you put down the threat but now you're probably more danger than you've ever been um, because of law enforcement's arriving um so be very, very aware. 360, so I would go to where you can see the exits, where they're going to be coming through. So you can say, hey, I'm, you know, get rid of the gun. Um, but it's hard to train that out of cops. It's yeah. hard to train them, get rid of your gun, stop being the alpha, go submissive. Um, and we have a blue on blue scenario. They're one of our scenarios is that the cop comes around the corner and he's in full guard, police badge, everything else. Blue, I'm a cop, police, police, and they don't hear it. They're in full auditory. They hear nothing. They put him down. He's instructed to go down. I've had him literally walk up to them, take the weapon off him, never seen the badge or anything else. Um, at one point, we had him, he's still breathing. They had the gun on him. He's still breathing. I thought, oh, God, they're going to shoot my role player again with sim rounds, right? Hold your breath. You're going to get shot again. Um, and then I get the comment of, why does he have a badge? So they still have, were not able to process out that they had just put down a cop. Um, and, but then, you know, we go over a debrief. You've got to be ready. Blue, you have to go submissive because you don't look like, you're thinking like a cop, but you don't look like them. Yeah. And civilian-wise, good God, thank you for putting the threat down, but your next biggest threat is, A, other concealed carry holders, right? They're waiting for that one, this is finally that one chance in their lifetime they get to actually use their training that they received one time in a year, right? Um and then you take a round from another civilian because you just shot someone. It looks like you've shot multiple people. I wonder sometimes, I, I know the cohort of people that you are describing who, mm-hmm. and I don't think it paints an accurate picture of the vast, vast majority of people who want to carry a concealed weapon for their own defense, but there is certainly a, and you see this online, and of course the barrier to saying something stupid online is very thin, if non-existent, <laughs> because is. you don't actually have to back it up. But you see the people... I would have shot that motherfucker. You know, they're like, I would agree with you. It almost seems as if they are waiting for that chance. They want to strap their Batman cape on Mm -hmm. for a day. I, there's no obvious way to safely pressure test that, but I feel like most people would perform woefully under the bravado that they spit out. The only way to pressure test it is do simulation based training. Even that is not, it's still not, (laughs) it's not. No, um, but you start taking sim rounds that somewhat sting, especially if you're in short sleeves. It's somewhat an emotional bookmark, right? You go, especially if they've been in the freezer overnight. That's what we do. Yeah. We they, they function better in the freezer. That's what I tell them. Yeah. They don't jam the gun as much. I would agree. And it hurts like, oh. Oh, it'll drop you like a sniper <laughs> shot to the chest. <laughs> yes. Calf shots with a frozen sim round. Oof. They all use, we just use sim munitions. We don't use a 223. The, the 223 rounds that have got the sim 
those hurt like hell. The rifle rounds. Those are almost at the point of breaking skin. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah, we don't we don't take it that far. Yeah, these are mostly pilots that I work with. So okay, they're pilots who are also federal agents. So in order to be work for CBP Air Marine Operations, yet you, you know your your police officer first. Mm-hmm. And then you're a pilot. So we kind of have to train that out of them because they're thinking I'm a pilot first, police officer second. No, you're actually Leo first and then you're a pilot. So a lot of them didn't even want to be cops. But in order to take that role on flying, they had to go through Federal Police Academy and they come out and they're federal agents. Do they just assume because they're likely going to be in an aircraft that they won't ever have any traditional law enforcement interactions? Pretty well. Pretty well. And that's and their biggest threat, as we tell them, is off duty. And your biggest threat is off duty. Um to and from they get deployed of course they can't carry them when they go out of country which blows my mind um they can't carry it all like they are totally 100 percent unarmed they go out to dominican republic or costa rica and they rely on local police to keep them safe well we oftentimes don't let other foreign entities carry in our country as well so That's true. it goes both yeah. ways yeah but they're they don't they don't think like cops um, some of them some of them were former leo um a lot of them former military, like this is their second career. How many of them do you think don't actually even carry in their off time? Because I'm sure it's not a it's not a requirement. About twenty five percent don't carry off duty. It doesn't surprise me actually. Um, no, and it's they just only get involved. Yeah. Um, we start telling people don't wear a uniform to work. Um, to you, and from, you mean? Yeah. 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 Don't 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 wear it, uh, especially after the George Floyd thing. Just don't. We had an agent down in Jacksonville um, who was going into Publix, which is grocery store. Yeah. Came out with a submarine sandwich, is walking out. Drew Stokes is his name. I'm walking out, and he has CBP federal agent on the back, and there was a guy in the parking lot that said, I fucking hate cops, and let him up four times right there in the parking lot. He survived? He survived. Um, we got a whole video on him, but he survived, but he had a long and yeah. they, he had a long recovery process. But he remembers every single of those rounds in him because he had no adrenaline dump, no endorphin dump. No, every ambushed. single. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the guy offed himself in the parking lot, but, uh, I support that. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing of active shooters now, a lot of them aren't, aren't doing that anymore. It used to be that we get an active shooter and they won't, you know, they pretty well at the end of their shooting episode, they'd off themselves. That doesn't seem to be trending that way as much. Well, the one in Maine, the most recent one, mm-hmm. when he went that route, he killed himself. Why yeah. do you think that is? I think they know it's coming. I don't know I, why, why they're not doing it. Yeah. Maybe they're actually afraid of death. Um, I don't know the Nashville shooter. I don't know if I don't know if he, she, whatever it is. Was that the one at the school? Yeah, the last four net, the last four active shooters have been trans or non-binary. I heard that was the case at the uh, Chiefs uh, parade as well, and the uh, the church shooting. I mean, I I guess I can understand the desire. Let me walk that back a second. I don't understand anything that leads people up to the point where I'm going to go slaughter innocent people. Maybe, though, they are, I don't know, maybe that step of killing themselves is beyond what they can fathom. But if you, you're you likely going to end up dead because law enforcement is going to yeah. engage that threat. Yeah. So the end state is relatively certain, I suppose. That's interesting. I wonder why they would have... It would have changed from them deciding to end their own life. To... Yeah, the Parkland shooter, he just kind of simulated and walked out with all the rest of the students. Um, yeah. He didn't want to kill himself. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. It's And we're finding these kids who are starting to shoot more and more. They're, they're quite accurate with their firearms, even though I've never had one. And I'll see what you think. The video games, you're going to yeah. call to duty. How much more sight picture time do they have than most people based on you see how accurate those sight pictures are eotech they're simulated though and they're using their hands on a controller versus like the actual stabilizing but i understand the the correlation that you're talking okay. about they at least understand what sight alignment is yeah yeah um fuck i mean how much would a video game like xbox controller apply to actual i mean you still have to grip the pistol you have to you do. present it to properly <clears throat> line up the sights it's in a three-dimensional environment instead of a two-dimensional environment God, I don't know. Maybe it's the best answer Maybe. we can give. They'd be more accurate nowadays with video games than you and I would have early if we just picked up a rifle and went to, to school to shoot. Yeah, our rounds probably wouldn't be nearly as accurate as what well, at least they know what an EOTech looks like, and they go, "Oh, there's that dot." Sure enough, there's or whatever. 
Do you think that's a solvable problem? No, we've got a mental health problem in this country. And that's, 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 Do you think that's a solvable problem? I think it has to start at home. The, the parents at some point need to be to take ownership or get more involved in their kid's life to kind of know what they're doing. Um, that's the only hope. I don't because it's starting at such a young age. Maybe broken families, whatever else. I'm divorced, but I'm very, very, very much involved in my kids' lives. I'm divorced as well. My, all and three of my kids live up here. Yeah, so I'm as involved as I can be to the degree that their ages and they will allow me. Spot to on. Be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. I wish I got more time with them. Mm -hmm. They have their own lives to live, especially the 20 and 18 year old. It's like fucking ships in the night. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> my daughter's 22. My son's 17. And yeah. I'll take what I can get. I mean, my son and I work out together and I'll grab whatever I can get with him. But Same. he wants to do what he wants to do. And I get that. Um, but I still try to keep an eye on him. You know, I I look for trends in behavior. He's a great kid, but everybody says about, you know, he was a great kid. Yeah, but he just killed 30 people in a school. I mean, so I like to think we all think that, but you need to be involved a little bit more. And not intrusive. I don't think you can really attack their privacy, but I think you have a right to dig a little deeper as a parent. I also think... that there may not be anything that you can do as a parent if that's the decision that your children made. At some point, they're adults, right? Well, or, or. you know, you know, just unabashed love for your kids, I totally get. Loving them for who they are, of course. Like, any parent's going to say that. If your kid is, like, hurting animals, predatory behavior, like, you have a responsibility to address that. Right. I also think you have a responsibility to safely store your firearms. Yes, you know that mm -hmm. people's in that age it seems to be this transient age for a lot of the shooters of uh, teens to 20s for the men mm -hmm. or I don't, older boys i don't you know i know 18 is a man but is fucking 18 really a man because no. it says that on your driver's license yeah i look back at my no. 18 year old self <laughs> i needed a good ass whipping so did i yep so i mean you don't know who you are you're traveling through and navigating through an incredibly horrible time in your life Maybe not horrible, challenging. It's it's going to be challenging at best. Like if you are an adult, a parent, and you have firearms and you don't safely secure those things and those are used in the execution of one of these shootings, I'm sorry, but your ass needs to be thrown in court too. And Personal opinion. That most recent case, the parents, was it the uh, – which shooting was it? They were convicted. I know. I just saw that. I, and I don't know which one of, was off the top of my head. Do you know what the reasoning was behind that? Was it their firearms that were used? I think they purchased a firearm for their child, the way I read it. Okay. Michael, did you find it? Uh, yeah, guilty of involuntary manslaughter. I'm trying to find out why. Um, I don't know, let me just pull the thing up. Unprecedented case. Well, everything is unprecedented the first time. All right, so four students were killed, seven others in 2021. The gunman himself was life, uh, life in prison without parole. Mother faces up to 60 years. Uh, scroll down. Keep on going. Oh, yeah, it does have to do with the gun. I mean, we don't have to dive into it too deep, but, you know, it was her husband's responsibility to keep track of the gun. She said she saw no signs of mental distress. I can believe that. I mean, your kids, it's, man, the wearing of a mask and the things that they could be dealing with that you have no idea of, I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it probably had something to do with the gun. I'm not even going to hypothesize on that anymore since we don't. I don't want to spend 20 minutes reading this article. But, yeah, it's an interesting conversation. Where does the responsibility, when should or when can the responsibility go back upstream towards the parents? And securing the weapons is important, but if you're in are your weapons secured all the time in your house, I mean, for self defense, I can't get to my gun safe or whatever else. But so there has to be. There's a difference between like, hey, I'm going to take a shower and put my pistol over here on the nightstand for 20 minutes, right? And I'm like, fuck, you know, I had a Glock somewhere. Last time I saw it, it was in the <laughs> spatula drawer. You know what I mean? Where did it go? Yeah, yeah. I know people like that. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I would know if I'm missing a gun, but. It, the Montana Classic is we'll just go straight in the cup holder. Yeah, you know. There. Yep. And I mean, I'm not a criminal by any stretch, but if I was, and I walked by a vehicle, and you can use them literally as 
tools to trade downstream or upstream for the drug mm-hmm. that you want or whatever it may be. I mean, yeah, that's the responsibility of the goddamn gun owner to yeah. securely store those things. Yep. They make safes for uh, vehicles that can go in the center mm-hmm. consoles. I get it. They're not cheap. Um, you know. But they, they, like you say, you can walk by a car and go, I want that and yeah. trade off on the street. Yeah, not uncommon for sure. I've had guns stolen. I had my house broken into in Arizona, and the guns were used in a crime, and I was sick to my stomach. They were yeah. locked in a safe. Did they take the whole safe? No, they drilled it. They burned through probably 14 drill bits. I'm like, at least lube the drip bits. If you're going to ruin everything, don't ruin my bits, too. Drilled the safe, got it out, and then it was using a crime down in Phoenix. And I That's a out. relatively sophisticated criminal. I mean, I'm assuming they need to know where to drill. Well, they, they were at my house for a week. I was out of town. What? Yeah. They were at your house for a week? Yeah, and the neighbors said nothing. They turned a blind eye. You know, like what? Dude, they were shitting in your toilet. I know, and renting porn, yeah. And took my kids' piggy bank. Well, they shit everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Yep, man. I wonder how long they were watching your house for. How the fuck did they know you were going to be gone for a week? I don't know if they just doorbell checked down. I have no idea. Yeah, but how did they know you weren't going to come back? That's true, yeah. I have questions. I, yeah. How long ago was this? Oh, geez, this was... 18 years ago. Did they catch him? No. No. The, it was Let's in- start a series called Cold Case. <laughs> and fine. fucking solve this. Okay. They, didn't, they knew what not to steal. They didn't steal the, the Jixer 1000 motorcycle. They didn't steal the things that were, they're going to get in a lot more trouble. Yeah. And that they would have died on. Yeah. Yeah. And, can, yeah. and I would end up treating them, flying them out. It would have been me going, oh, damn, there's my motorcycle and my gun. It is wild they felt comfortable enough to stay for a week. Mm-hmm. I feel like you might have had a level of surveillance on you. What type of crime were they used in? Uh, that I don't know, because I don't know if, because this was in Prescott, Arizona. Yeah, oh, I'm very familiar with Prescott. And the crime, so the gun was found in Phoenix. So they could have been sold. They pro- Honestly, they probably just it entered into that uh, ecosystem. Stayed at your house for a week. Yeah. Yeah, just took the rear sliding door and untracked it and slid it over. and The lock didn't mean anything. They just literally untracked the whole sliding door. Yeah, I was I was pretty violent. I was pretty pissed. And yeah. once the gun was used in the crime, they said, we found your gun. I said, I don't want it back. I said, just burn it. You know, incinerate it. I don't need it back. It's, yeah. it's tainted. I don't want it. Interesting. All right. I feel like there might have been a deeper level there. Probably. Yeah. And I, I didn't really think about that until now. Yeah. But, I mean, how uh, did they know you didn't, weren't going to come back that night? What if you had come back that night? You know? It's true. Yeah, no, no. We don't want to know. How do they know to drink, bring a drill? How do they know you had a safe in well, your Oh, they house? used my own drill. Okay. Yeah. What else did they steal from your house? Two bicycles, mountain bike and road bike. Um, expensive bikes. Um, but then just the safe. And the safe, they they left the safe in there. They no, just I mean, drilled. they opened it. Yeah. And took a rifle, 270, um, and my Glock. Okay. Luckily, I don't have the gun collection I do now. Because um, it would have been a disaster. Hypothetically. In case yeah, they're still, hypothetically. In case they're still watching. ATF, we're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're all legal. Yeah. All right. How'd you find your way into your line of work? I started out as a law enforcement major at OU. and uh, What does that even mean? Uh, it's political science, basically. Get a bachelor's. And I hated poli sci. I could not do it as the most boring subject known to mankind. Didn't do well. Was headed back to my grandparents one evening and had an auto pedestrian happen in front of me. A lady was walking across the road and gets hit by a car about 70, and she dies right in front of me. So I get out to my car, and I'm like, what do I do? There's nothing I can do. This is a glob of human. And went to EMT school. Um, I thought, well, maybe law enforcement anything. I got through EMT school and decided eh, EMTs don't know much. Did you make the choice to go to EMT school because in that moment you didn't like that feeling of helplessness? Mm-hmm. 100%, okay. yep. Um and they went to intermediate paramedic school and realized I still don't know much. And they went all the way through paramedic school and uh, worked as a medic for years. Wanted to get into flying. Wanted to get on a helicopter do medical evac. And thought I had to be an RN to do that. Uh, I didn't know any better. The people I'd been exposed to were both RNs and paramedics at the same time. I thought, well, shit, i got to go to nursing school. And I hated nurses. I could not stand nurses. Well, you're going to need to unpack that a bit. <laughs> well, it was one of those deals that I would take a patient to the hospital as a medic to a nurse, and knowing that I could do more skills than he or she could, and they're making triple what I was. Uh, we, most medics are pretty bitter toward the nurses because we're thinking on our own as medics. We're able to do a little bit more versus an RN who mostly does what they're told by the doctor. 
So there's it's a territorial thing. I get that, but why well, hate the person who just chose a different avenue? They didn't create. The they didn't. Yet. They did not. It was a more an animosity thing, okay. probably jealousy thing. Um, but I thought, well, I got to become a nurse. I got to play this game. Um, I went through nursing school, got through it. Uh, didn't tell anybody in school I was a medic, and they figured out the last semester that okay. And I'm like, yeah. Well, the last semester is when Oklahoma City bombing happened. And I was like, I need to go back for this. Why? What do you do? And I'm like, well, I need to, you know, I, I feel like I need to get back there. Um, then they figured out I was a medic. Um, Would they really have cared, do you think? Yeah. My nursing director said, well, that I was a medic. Yeah. I, I just wanted to be left alone. Like, I didn't want to feel like, hey, let's ask God all the questions. I wanted to absorb. I went into nursing school with the sole purpose of getting a helicopter. Yeah. So my reasoning behind going was not necessarily to take orders from a physician. It was to get deeper knowledge of medicine and be able to assess and diagnose. So I was digging much deeper in what – it was an 8-to-5 job for me for nursing school. I mean, I dug in and did way more than whatever – I could have done a bare minimum. That's mm-hmm. not me. Um, so I really just didn't want to be that go-to person the entire class. Let's ask Scott. Let's ask Scott. Or I just wanted to sit and back. Okay. And, and, just absorb and be left. They wouldn't alone. have cared though. No, not at okay. all. Okay, no, you not were at all. Saying that they would no. have, because uh, I, I would have imagined in a healthcare profession, previous knowledge and experience would be welcomed, not frowned upon. Yeah, no, and it and, and it is. But then you're that then you're that classmate, right? Um, so I got through nursing school and started working ER. You know, I needed time as an RN. Um, Did you go back to the Oklahoma City bombing? I went back two days. It was body recovery by the time I got back. How was that? Yeah, it was rough. I was talking to a lot of the people, and yeah, it was rough. It At was, the two-day mark, were they even hopeful that there might have been survivors in there? No, not really. How do they do that? Um, do you just slowly start moving debris, and when you find – Start moving to, debris, and you find a body. And um, it slows down at that yeah. point? Yeah, and and you're looking for other devices too. God, they they were pulled out of oh, that. They didn't know it was that it was a U-Haul truck or something like rider that. Rider right? truck. They probably didn't know that at that point. No. Yeah, they were pulled out of that scene three times, thinking they found another device, and everybody had to leave, come back, leave, come back. Um, but at that point, it was just they're clearing rubble. You now there's another body. Um, yeah, it was it was. Then the smell started getting because it, it started raining, and then the water had to spray. It was it was not a pleasant. But my nursing instructor, my director said. The day it happened, she said, you can go, but you're going to start the semester over. And I was like, hmm. I was pretty bitter about that because these are my people back here. I, I felt like I needed to get back. But I had just spent three years trying to get where I was at. Yeah. It, to me, it, I would have gone back. I couldn't afford to go back. Financially, student loan-wise, I couldn't afford to go back. And time-wise. Yeah. So two days later, I went. Um Spent time in the ER, got in first air medical job in Gallup, New Mexico. Um, I drove across the whole state just to get a flight experience um, in an old fixed wing, small Cessna 410. So small that the pilot had to hold up the tail when we loaded the patient in, because otherwise it would flip over. Um, so you had somebody flying and you were providing medical care to the yeah. patient? Yep. Okay. Um, fixed wing. So wasn't my thing. I didn't really want to do it, but I knew I needed a flight time of some sort to get into rotor. Was that um, more of a transport anyway with the fixed yeah, wing? Yeah. yeah. Stabilized uh, transport or yeah. a higher level of care. Yeah, that happens up here sometimes as well. I didn't realize, nor do I think most people realize there's a very thin veneer of capability, not only from a law enforcement perspective, from a medical perspective. So I, uh, in December, had that intestinal blockage and ended up having surgery. Mm-hmm. The doctor was bouncing back and forth between two hospitals. The person capable of doing my surgery, it, it was... What would be the most accurate way to describe this? It wasn't life-threatening in the moment, but it, you know, if it had not been treated, it would have certainly had cascading severe injuries and could have been life-threatening to include like intestinal and bowel issues, which I don't have, thankfully. But yeah, they're like he's back and forth. Yeah, you might it's... the doc might be stuck in traffic, mm-hmm. and you're sitting there needing a surgery. The veneer is thin. It is, and it's, <laughs> and you had. How you didn't – you should have come out with a colostomy. I mean, every every small bad obstruction that I've seen in my career, you come out with a – you're pooping in a bag until those intestines fix again. I think they caught it at a time. The doc said I was about 24 hours away from needing that colostomy bag. Yeah. But he also – there was no dissection of intestine or bowels. It was the kink in the intestines that had worked its way through a loop of scar tissue on the inside lining of my stomach and cinched itself off. 
I was trying to you, I was trying to figure that whole thing out. But so okay, they went in okay. laparoscopically, okay. and I guess they could see the obstruction and the it being bound. I don't fucking know what they would describe it as, but everything downstream of that was black due to lack of blood flow. So they zip me open, um, removed the scar tissue first, and this is a conversation I'm repeating. I was not. I guess I was physically there, but not mentally or emotionally present when the doctor was talking to my wife. He said that as soon as he cut the scar tissue, the color of the intestines immediately started returning back to normal. And he understood what would potentially happen later in my life if you start dissecting intestines and bowels. Yeah. And he said he wanted to give my body the opportunity to not have to deal with that. Right. So then I guess then they pull all that shit out and they work their way through every it. Every single, like, every inch. 20 feet of intestines. Let me just tell you, I'm glad I wasn't late for that. Because <laughs> I remember the docs, yeah, I remember the anesthesiologist saying, I'm going to give you some for the pain. And then I went, what happened? Yeah. You wake <laughs> up and go, did I have, oh. I'm so happy that I was not present for that two and a half hours. I woke up with an NG tube. Fuck those things. <laughs> we train on each other. That's how we learn those. They came in, this young, um, I probably was a nurse, came in with what she described as two of her little ducklings, which I think were people there doing their learning time. Yeah, yeah. She was very excited. We're going to get you set up. We're going to give you an NG tube. And I looked at her and I said, <laughs> no, you're not. Nope. And she said, why? And I said, because I've put those in on people. Uh -huh. And she, I, she's like, I know all the tricks. The lidocaine and all this. I'm like, get the fuck out of this room. <laughs> and he <laughs> and woke up with one, though, didn't he? He told me he was going to. He's yeah. like, we're going to give you an NG tube. I'm like, I don't give a shit what you do when I'm out. Right. Uh, and then let me tell you, the chainsaw start, pull of when that thing comes out. Daddy. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Yeah. And it is Take a deep all breath, the way out. Yeah. Bury your chin. <laughs> and she pull started a lawnmower. Uh-huh. And it, <laughs> out comes, yeah. No. You would think it was a small one. It's about three feet of tubing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We go from your nose to your ear to your belly button. That's how we measure. Here, here. That's how long. It was so bizarre because not that the, the pain that I experienced in my stomach was horrendous for sure. Like profusely sweating through all of my clothes that I was wearing. That tube, though, it was on my on my left hand side. You know, I'm laying in that hospital bed after for I had it for about 24 hours after surgery. Mm -hmm. And if you moved your head one way, you'd feel it like contacting the back of your throat, and then you get that drip. And so, like, you're trying to sleep with your head at this yep. angle. Meanwhile, I'm just like the lauded, please, and just, <laughs> just play. Keep pushing the button. Yeah, they would just come in every two hours, and I, and I said, can we just have it where if I don't ask what, what was I saying? I was like, keep giving it to me until I say I don't want any more. Like, can we just do that until I get this fucking tube out of my? Head? It was the only way I could sleep. Did they do that? Yeah, that was nice. They you, would. I mean, how anybody can rest in a hospital? You don't. No. Every two hours they have a business meeting in your room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Hey, how yep. are you doing? I was doing fucking great until you just woke me up. <laughs> two hours later. Beep, 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 beep. Hey, how's it going? Not as good as it was five minutes ago, and I was sleeping. So they would tell me, they're like, hey, it's, you know, because I was on a particular time, but life got way better once that tube came out. They're uncomfortable. And imagine those people even in there for, I mean, a month at a time. I mean, you're getting sores on the inside of your nose. They're on a ventilator because we have to put an NG tube, NG tube down you for an event. Um, just kind of standard. Or an OG. Sometimes they'll slide it right next to your endotracheal tube down in your stomach. Um, but the OG is a little bit better because it's not going through your nose. Uh, I'm going to say hard pass on both. Yeah. I've only experienced one, and I don't need to experience the other. I guess they pulled a liter and a half of fluid out of my stomach, though, before the surgery. So Everything was backed up? Had nowhere to go? Yeah, and you know, I don't know how much it would have helped me if I had done that before the surgery. I don't know how much of the pain it would have removed, if any. And I don't care, because I no. don't want that thing shut no. down my no. nose. <laughs> well, you didn't wake up during surgery, so it's just good. Um, they call I don't it remember waking up. They call that recall. It's a very expensive lawsuit. With the anesthesiologist, it's a horrible thing. And it's called recall from the yeah. anesthesiologist, which means you wake up in the middle of it. Is the anesthesiologist literally just sitting there monitoring? Like, how do they know you're out-out? Are they looking at vital signs? How can they tell that they're so they giving the appropriate have nerve stimulator. So it's a little deal they put on your cheek. Yep. And they push it, and it's like a TENS unit. Okay. And they see how much you're, it's called a twitch. They're looking to see how much you twitch. Um, and also the surgeon, while he's working on you, will start to feel muscles starting to, you'll start to come out and they'll start to spasm. They, hey, he's starting to spasm. Um, and they'll either re-paralyze you, chemically paralyze you, or snow you with a little bit more anesthetics. Um, okay. So more than likely you may have been paralyzed for a while, chemically paralyzed. 
You don't out. remember? Two right. and a half hours. Yep. It was. I had never been in an OR. You know, they moved me over to the table and they strapped my arms down. And I had heard people, hey, they'll have you count backwards or a, a mask or whatever. They had just given me some ketamine about an hour before that. I was in a good amount of pain and mm-hmm. I was having a hard time laying flat. So it was obviously not comfortable to go from the movable hospital bed to the very, it seemed very rigid surgical right. bed. I've also heard that they'll like articulate you up and all over the place during the surgeries. The bed itself moves around. Yeah. But he, I think he could tell that I was in a good amount of pain. And literally the last thing I remember was he patted me on the shoulders like, hey, I'm going to give you something for the pain. And then that was it. That night, and you wake up to me, your was, surgery's over. Yeah, it was people around the bed, and I was. he had told my wife, like, and when he comes out, he'll probably be shaking and cold, and that's kind of what it felt like. Mm-hmm. I felt like I had the chills, and it's like, whoa. <laughs> It'll take about six months to get all anesthesia out of your system. So if what? you still, yeah, it sits in your adipose tissue, your fat tissues, for quite a while, um, up to six months. Some people a little bit quicker, some people a little bit longer. Um, yeah. So if you still feel like, oh, am I still kind of just tired or whatever, you may still have anesthesia left. Because you were in surgery for how many hours? Two and a half. Yeah, you may not have a whole lot left. When you get to the four-hour mark and you're under, you've been under gas that long, you're going to have a little bit longer issues. As far as how shitty the situation was, I came out of it pretty oh, good. Oh, my God, yeah. I actually think it solved some stomach issues I was having. I think I had had like, that kink in my intestines for a really long time. Yeah, that didn't happen overnight. Yeah. So, yeah. And I also don't know why it happened in that moment. I was doing a podcast with my buddy, Mike Glover, and I took mm-hmm. a sip of coffee. And I remember feeling the first indication mm-hmm. of pain. It was just weird, but it wasn't something that I hadn't felt before. It's like, oh, damn, dinner last night. It's going to be a fun ride here in a little bit. Right. And then just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And of course, I rolled for like an hour and a half because I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> and then told my wife that I would drive. And then I was like, it's just a stomach ache. What are the doctors going to do? And then I was laying on the emergency room uh, floor, waiting room, because it was I was sweating and it was cooler on the floor than I was mm-hmm. sitting in the chair. So, how did it take them to get you back in the ER? Uh, they had to wheel in two other people first. Uh, one of the this poor bastard. And again, this is a story my wife told me. I didn't see this. I guess he had a pretty clearly broken foot. Was just sitting in a chair though, waiting. And as they wheeled him by, and I'm on the floor, he mouths or he goes, "I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it should have been you." I mean, you're curled up in a field position. And the other people in the way, one of them was, I think, was like a severe cold or something like that. And they're look, kind of looking over at me as their name is getting called first. And I was really, I didn't give a fuck at that point. You know, I was not interested in who went in or what was going right, on. I was just right. trying to kind of make it through the moment. But I guess my wife was just kind of looking at this like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah. Tell your wife to stay off WebMD, by the way. Uh, actually, it's a problem for her. <laughs> she was like, I was waiting for them to say it was cancerous. Math, just all she was doing when I was in surgery was spiraling through WebMD. It, you go down deep, dark holes. She does it dark. in bed at night. Like if she has a cold, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I think I have to saw yeah. my head off. You know, it's, I have cancer of the yeah. brain. I'm like, I think you have a sinus infection. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that thing has been more annoyance to the medical world. Oh, because people had. call thinking oh, they have yeah. stuff. And yeah, I, Maybe there is a chance you have that, but 99% of the time, it's not that. But in your head, suddenly you're dying. You're, you're white out your will. I'm gone. It's, 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 yeah. My wife said she literally was like holding herself back at moments from panic because of what she was finding on WebMD. What can cause, into, she's just like cancerous masses, you know, atrophy. I'm just like, put your fucking phone down. Yeah. Just be here for me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you're working in the ER. Yep. Worked ER and then I eventually transferred to flight. Um, got on a rotor flight out in Arizona, moved to Mesa, Arizona, um, Williamsfield Air Base, which was recently converted to civilian side. Mm-hmm. Started in rotor wing out there. Um, did many years, about 20 years air medical, um, kind of on and off and went back to Oklahoma, flew in Oklahoma. Is that kind of like essentially life flight? Yeah. When you say air medical? Yeah. Yeah. So you're responding to shit. That is gnarly. Yeah. Yeah, you're not calling life flight for no. a guy who uh, bounces his head off the steering wheel and has a concussion. No, no, it's it's legit work. In Arizona, most of their flights are scene, scene work, so which means they're actually landing at the scene of doing scene work, um, which is kind of different. Most air medical, like Oklahoma, a lot of it's inner facility, mm-hmm. so hospital A to hospital B. Um, Arizona, we did a lot of them. Um, sometimes we're first on scene out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I guess that makes sense. Yeah, again, the veneer is thin, reporting time, yeah. you know, or, or responding time, I should say. Yeah, so I got to do, I have over 650 patient flights in my career. Documented every single one of them. They had a little three-ring binder. I put down the patient's age, sex, what the mechanism of the injury was, what I did for them. 
um, flight number. I did it just in case I needed, if we went to court 20 yeah. years down the road, I'd have no memory. But what's weird, because I look at them now, I have no memory of any of these. None whatsoever. I was just going to ask you, out of those 600, are there any that stand, uh, stand out to you? One. And that's it. What was it? Um, DPS officer. And I, the, the reason why it stands out is because I revisited it too many times afterwards. And it pulled it out of that compartment we put everything in. And I could never get it back in. But it was a DPS officer. Um, it was kind of a fucked up. The whole thing was fucked up. What does DPS stand for? Department of Public Safety. I was so, say, it was right on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, me. Arizona Highway Patrol. We got put on standby for a... Uh, an auto accident on interstate. And I knew it was our last flight of the day. Um, we couldn't take any more because the pilot was timed out. So once FA, they can't fly anymore. Yep. I was catching a flight to Albuquerque to pick up a pickup truck. So I knew we re refueled at Sky Harbor Airport. Um, so I threw my bag in the back of the aircraft because I knew after the flight, I could just get out at the airport and catch a shuttle and go jump on the airplane. Look at you using government was, assets <laughs> as a taxi service. This is civilian assets, sir. Paid for by tax dollars. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yep. Hundred percent yes. But we don't waste anything. In we're this just country. talking about efficiency. Yes. I know yes. exactly what so, you're talking about. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's efficient. Saved money. Yeah. Because it was less weight going back. I didn't want to. Yep. Yeah. Let's go with that. Um. So we got put on standby for an accident, and I'm like, I don't know if we'll go or not. Sometimes we'll go. Sometimes we won't. They went and launched us, and uh, we're circling the scene on Superstition Highway, and I see one car down there, and I'm like, that's odd. The whole highway shut down. You know, all six lanes are shut down. And we put the aircraft down in the middle of interstate, and I grab my bag, and I'm walking up. I'm walking towards. I'm looking at it, and it's like, oh, fuck, that's a vehicle that's smoldering. And uh, walking up, and a fire, Phoenix Fire meets me halfway and goes, hey, do you have any, do you have any fentanyl? So you have pain meds. And I said, I got tons. And he goes, it's a DPS officer. He's going to need a lot. I'm like, oh, Jesus. So get closer to him. By the time we get closer, I see the vehicle that's smoldering, and I see the officer on the ground. And he's black from head to toe. His gun belt's burned into him. His boots are burned into him. Um, his head's probably two times the size normal. Um, it's been long enough now. I don't think if the family heard this, they probably... What was the cause of the head being two times the size? Swelling. Just from the swelling burns. From the burns. Um, got How down. did his car start on fire? So he got... You know, the Crown Vicks are, were kind of notorious when they got rear-ended was catch on fire. Really? Um, they had an issue with that, especially the... Uh, the law enforcement edition, okay, electronics, whatever else, um, kind of a known issue with the older Crown Vicks. He got rear-ended. Um, I get down next to him. And I'm like, let's let's get him go. He is. They tried to crack him, and I was trying to bag him, which means I'm trying to get air into him. I couldn't get it. His he was completely clamped down, circumferential burns, right? So his chest couldn't expand. So I thought, well, I need we need to cut him. I need to be able to, to be able to expand his lungs. So did a grid pattern, a scarotomy. So did a grid pattern on his chest. And sure enough, as soon as I did that, it was boom, popped up. And I could bag him a little bit better. And I said, we need to get him out of here. Um, I'll get the IV in the aircraft. Let's just go. Well, his left arm was stuck at a 90-degree angle. And I log rolled him. So we're putting on the backboard behind him so we can get him an aircraft. I log roll him onto my flight suit. Okay. And then I roll him back, and his skin stays in my flight suit. No big deal. Whatever. You know, I've done this before. It's Get him. Kind of a big deal, Scott. <laughs> it is, but we kind of. I know what you mean. Parmalize. I know what you mean, and yeah. it's easy to say it's not a big deal. It's a fucking big deal. Yeah, it is to people, I guess, who don't deal with it. But how about to everybody? It is to include and the it, people that do deal with it. And it came, yeah, it came with a price, a yep. better price. Um, got that left arm, and I thought we can't get the helicopter door closed with that arm stuck out at ninety degree angle. And what I kept, kind of bird was it in? Uh, 206. So, so Bell, Bell 206. Okay. So small aircraft. Two rotor blades? Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, oh. Like a news chopper. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, long Ranger. So it's got the it's yep. longer fuselage. Um, I kept looking at him going, why is that arm out? I'm going through my head. Why is his arm? Well, the only thing I come up was he was trying to get out of his patrol car. He was pushing on it and that's when it flashed. So I pulled his arm across him and I was scared to death it was going to break. It was just, yeah. everything was, so got him tied across, got him in the aircraft and I had absolutely nowhere to get an IV on this guy. Everything I couldn't feel veins. His, his skin was as hard as his table is. Put my electrodes on him to see if he had a heart rate. This would slop off. Nothing would stick to his skin. And Was he alert or aware at all? I have no idea. And that's the thing that haunts me is I'm like, because I wanted to give him something for pain. Yeah. Um, 
and I couldn't. I had no options. I could not. Uh, the burn center was about two minute flight away. I'm huge on not spending time on scene. Um, you get into a higher level of care. higher level because that's their best chance. It's but, not me. Yeah, I'm just a link in the chain. I can do a lot of deep medicine. You're an amazing link in the chain, but that, there's that golden hour, right? Yeah, get them to a fucking operating table. Yep. Um, I'll tell you an interesting statistic here in a little bit that's well, kind of scary. Um, it's got him an aircraft. I'm like, I have no idea if this guy's alive. I'm still bagging him. I don't know if he's got pulse. I, I don't know. I can't even feel for a pulse. Um, am I bagging a dead body? I don't know. Uh, landed at the burn center, and we got him out, and there's this long line of DPS officers, and they're bawling. And I'm like, oh, good God. I'm trying to get past this. Um, get him inside. They start an IV in his big toe with a 24-gauge. That's all they could get. That's I didn't not, know that was an option, to be honest. Yeah, that's the only place they had. Um, you can't get flus for test station through that. Long story short, he lasts about an hour. Um, as I'm walking back to the aircraft, news media is showing up, and they want to talk to us. I'm like, just leave me the fuck alone. Um, and I'm starting to kind of wind down from this a little bit uh, and go around the other side of the aircraft where they can't see me, and I'm like, God damn it. You know, I'm fighting tears. I'm trying. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I didn't do anything for this guy. Um, and partner comes out she's struggling with this she's not doing well with this flight either uh we had and take off we fly to sky harbor i get my stuff out this flight lasted a lot longer than i thought i, had. I didn't have any any chance to change my clothes i'm still in my flight suit uh get to sky harbor and i'm in the airport and i'm i'm looking at my thighs right it's still got a skin stuck to my thighs and here i am in the airport uh look up at the tv monitor and i'll be damned if they don't show him with his family on the TV. Well, then it became personal. Now, now suddenly, he, family, normal looking. I had no idea what this guy looked like. Not burned. Um, now I'm looking at his family the monitor, and I was like, Oh Jesus, how do I get rid of this? How do I, how do I get this out of my head? I have a windshield wiper method. It wasn't going away. It was staying right there. I'm like, oh, leave. The whole flight from Phoenix to Albuquerque, I'm just like looking at my thighs, going like. Mm. I want him off my flight suit, right? I need this off my flight suit, and I need to get past this. Uh, and as soon as I got to Albuquerque, nearest bathroom, dumped the clothes, uh, got some normal clothes, um, left, actually put them in a bag and left them in the I left my whole flight suit right there. Mm -hmm. Didn't want anything to do with it. So that's one I do remember greatly because it got really personal really quickly. Um, you know, most of the time we fly people out, I don't know their name. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Uh, they don't usually remember us. If we do our job right and we give them medication, they don't, you know, if, if it's bad enough, I'm controlling their pain. And if I have to intubate them, they're getting sedated with some sort of, you know, sedative, yeah. um, amnesia, the milk of amnesia, Versed. Yeah. Yep. So if I do my job right, they don't remember me. Um, this one got real personal. And I end up doing an empty chair. Um, a friend of mine who's a mental health professional said, let's do an empty chair uh, therapy session. I'm like, what is that? What's an empty chair? She said, I want you to sit down in a room by yourself, a quiet room. I want you to put an empty chair in the corner and tell him what you would want to tell him if you were sitting right in front of him. And let it all out. Um, and I did. I was like, I'm so sorry I didn't do anything for you. I had his name and everything else. I still, the name's gone. Like I said, but did the empty chair and it, it did well because it gave me the ability to tell someone, you know, I wasn't in a chair to, Hey, I didn't do shit for you. I'm so sorry. You know, I wish I could have covered you with snowed you with pain medications during the time that, you know, fourth degree burns really aren't painful. Yeah, um, because it severs the nerve end. Exactly. Yeah. You, know, you get third and fourth, it severs the nerves, but who knows? I mean, it's uh so that's one I do remember deeply, but. The rest of 649, I look at them like, God, that sounds horrible. <clears throat> what do you think that means you can't remember any of the other ones? I think that their mind puts things deep places. We see things that we normally aren't supposed to see. Because I may have back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back calls. I may have seven flights. I can't ponder on that first flight, so I put it in a compartment. I literally go tss -tss with my hands. Um, yeah, what's this windshield wiper technique you have? It just goes away. It goes away nowhere healthy. What is it, though? Like, what, what's the mechanism you talk yourself through? Um, just go away. 
leave my thoughts. Go, go. Um, so you're bossy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm bossy over myself. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I am. Type A, right? That's what we do. Um, but you were able to wipe it like that. Yeah, most of them, yeah. And I can, like I said, I have no memory. Um, I don't know if that's the right vernacular. It's probably... I think you have plenty of memory. I don't know where it went or where you well. put it, but I'm pretty sure it's still there. It's there, but it's in a compartment that I don't really even know what room that file cabinet or file is in, um, which came in effect, you know, when with the incident of my mom. Um, but the ability to do that, like I said, it's not healthy. And I knew I reached a point that I couldn't, comp I couldn't, that file cabinet was stuffed. And I knew the point because I was driving down the road with my kids and I'm talking to them about Hitler, how bad a person he was, whatever else. I break out into tears. I have a question. Okay. <clears throat> how the fuck did that get onto that conversation? <laughs> of Hitler? Yeah. Um, so, I, by the way, on this road trip, guys, <laughs> let's talk about Hitler. Let's talk about <laughs> mass genocide and yeah. an uplifting conversation. Yeah. Um, I don't Not remember. Not the most common fucking road trip <laughs> conversation with your kids. I think my daughter was studying World War II and they okay. brought up Hitler. That at least makes It wasn't more out sense. of the blue, I promise yeah. you. Hey, let's talk about Hitler, guys. You guys want to listen to Mein Kampf <laughs> while we drive? I mean, <laughs> fuck, dude. <laughs> Here's Doc Al. Here's yeah. Auschwitz. Let's talk about it. Yeah. But I lost it. I just started bawling. And I'm like, what the hell? What is there? Where'd this come from? Like, I had Do you no. Remember at what point in the conversation or why that started? Um,. I think when he's talking about the concentration camps, we got in that because I had toured Dachau. I've been there, and I started talking about Dachau, and uh, you know, normally in the past I could just talk about it, but at this point I reached the point I couldn't. I burst out into tears, and I thought, "What is going on here? I, that I've got no ability to cope with anything anymore." And I and I went to therapy. I was like, "Hey, let's do therapy." Uh, DDMDR did all sorts of stuff, and. Uh, internal family IFS internal family systems which mm -hmm. is a pretty interesting I don't know anything about that it is kind of a cool therapy technique so it's internal family, family systems, systems. Okay. yeah when, IFS. When, when she first told me I was like oh, I don't involve my family this is me but it doesn't have anything to do with your immediate family it's you it's basically inside your body you've got different guards whatever else you've got one person one version of you that uh, doesn't want to allow let's say allow access i'm not going to let you access this door um this personality or not personality it makes me like have mpd but this individual protective mechanism is not going to allow no nope, no nope, we're not going to let you access this because it causes pain so you talk to this in theory person and say hey i really i know what you're doing i know why you're doing it but i need you to step aside because i need to get a little bit deeper i need to get to the next level so thank you for what you're doing um, you're no longer really needed to protect that vault. It's so, almost like avatars of yourself. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, and it was it was pretty deep because you go through an initial part where you figure out kind of who you are and personalities and trait personality traits. You know, are you type A? Are you the person who cries a lot or not? You know, you should go through this whole evaluation phase and figure out who these protective mechanisms are. So you at one by one, you start to ask them to step aside. And get to the next level. Okay, I appreciate what you're doing. I know what you're doing. You're trying to protect me. Um, but I need you to step aside. Um, you're no longer needed. And we're going to get to the next level. Is this internal self-talk or are you verbalizing, verbalizing. this to yourself? Um, verbalizing. Okay. With a therapist. Okay. Um, so that works some of it. It helped unpackage a lot of these things. I was like, okay, I'm, I've, that file cabinet has kind of been cleared. I couldn't, like I didn't go back and dig into the calls or whatever else because I just don't, that, that's still somewhere I don't know where they're at. I look at the flights. I know where's there, but I don't know where I put them. They're yeah. somewhere. Um, yeah, it, so that works some a little bit. Uh, when I stepped away from flying now, like I said, I'm with CBP and also with Oklahoma County Sheriff. Uh, I'm a team leader for their attack team, a bomb squad on the medical side. Um, so I don't do as much patient care anymore, other than it's my operators or friends and family who are hungover. I've started more IVs on hungover people and the last month than I have my entire life, I think. Why the last month? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, start up. One Is of there our, a particular, particular like no? Oklahoma season that we are, <laughs> you guys celebrate that we're not aware no. of here? No, I actually did it. Uh, I can't, I did it at work one day. Yeah. Um, but we made a bleed. I would have never utilized government uh, medical supplies to fix a This hangover. is my personal. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 
My personal equipment. It's not. All right. Well, Our 18 out. deltas were awesome. A little oxygen, a little touch of nitrous oxide if you have access to it, and, and IV for therapy. Our corpsman used to give us the IVs while we were still drinking. <laughs> you know, what goes in must come out. It, yeah, mm -hmm. we are. First off, giving 18 to 25 year old young special operations soldiers medical training and then access to alcohol, <laughs> absolutely yeah. fucking nothing good comes from that. But it, you know, I will say it does wonders on a hangover. It cures them, and it puts them right back in a fight slash yeah. bar. Yeah. Um, I am fascinated why the last month, though. You need to dig into that and report back to me. <laughs> I don't know either. Okay. I've gotten a couple of people. Um, but it's pretty notorious. I mean, it's call Scott. I'm the medical guy. I know more stuff about my operators than anybody else does, and I keep it to myself, as they know. But um, I'm kind of the go-to. Um because like, I know a lot of shit. <laughs> yeah. That well, seems like you better on the block if you tell us. Who, whose phone to delete or get rid of if they're involved in a shooting where it needs to go? I need you to wipe my phone for me. and Yeah. yeah. All that stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of up to where I'm at. So when you first reached out to me, mm -hmm. I think I'm almost positive we could look back that the subject line was, I euthanized my mom. Yes. As any, I consider I'm the most normal person that I know for clarity. I rate myself <laughs> as the most normal person on earth. I saw that hit my inbox. I'm going to read that email. Um, and it's largely what led us here today. Um, I will let you unpack that one. Okay. We're going to go pretty deep into it. When did it occur in your career as well? I'm curious as to the time. This was seven years ago. So it was after I had quit flying. Okay. So, um, Pretty well done. I actually tried to leave the medical career, and um, I built rifles for surgeon rifles for a little while. It was a great job. Made minimum wage. Worked on bows. I was a bow tech, so compound bows, whatever else. And then finally went back to medicine because it's all I know. I mean, it was easy. It's easy to me. So, yeah. Um, yeah so we'll jump into that. Uh, my mom is a great woman. She's a counselor. Counseled many, many Leo all the way to, as you know, on the military side, you don't often go. She saw a lot of military people from Cannon Air Base, which is now a special ops base in New Mexico, Clovis, sure. New Mexico. Um, and she would see a lot of military people on the side, private pay, so it stays off the record and they're never. Um, I hope that they're changing that system. I know what you're talking about. Got to hope so, too. They were trying to seek assistance outside of the purview of their direct supervisor. Mm -hmm. When I've been out now for a good stretch, over a decade. It seemed as if it was changing, but I, it's always that tough. And I hear this from officers all the time too. Like there's all these systems in place for officers in their department, but the fear still exists. If you seek this help, what is going to be the occupational ramifications of that? The badging gun from the, yeah. the police officer realm. Sometimes I'm going to say that I think badges and guns should be held onto, not taken, Right. They're like, hey, we're going to put you on the bench for a bit. And the right. same thing happens for special operations people, all of those things. The fear is is that you'll never get it back. I don't know how to necessarily bridge that gap, but it seemed like as, as, a, as when I was leaving, they were trying to address that and provide more options. I think most people go the route you're talking about. Under the radar, out of pocket, no records, please. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it's spouse pushed. You need, bear, you, you need to go get help. Yeah. Um, FAA. The pilots, if they when they get their annual, um, if they've been seeing anybody for a counselor for depression or whatever else, they may not get their ticket. Or if they get put on an SSRI, no, they're done. done for twelve at least. Yeah, well, those SSRIs are devil medicine. They work well, but coming off them was miserable. But yeah. um, so, mom, great counselor, she's a phenomenal woman. Um, smoked for fifty two years. Smoked for her entire life. Um, and I told her long ago. I said, "You're gonna, you're gonna." miss your granddaughter's graduation and keep doing this it was her thing um she didn't want to stop um, but she made me promise her years and years ago that hey don't ever let me suffer and i said okay well we're not there yet but i won't let you suffer she knew what i did knew what i obviously my career mm -hmm. um her mom had died um in december of 2016 and my mom had came down for the funeral um and we'd been arguing a little bit just i was stressed over something the only voicemail i had from her the only time the only voice recording is a voicemail from her saying 
that just said, hey, pumpkin, just called me. You know, hope you're not still mad at me. Um, <coughs> but so it was kind of a rough time. Um, she was a little bit short of breath at that point. And I was like, she's always getting head colds, chest colds. She smokes, you know. Um, she works around horses. You're going to get sick. Sent her home with my daughter's inhaler. I said, yeah, use this. Um, she got all the way home back to Clovis, New Mexico, and uh, got worse and worse and worse, short of breath. Ended up going to the hospital, um, found a huge mass on her left lung. Um, and stage four diagnosis, stage four cancer diagnosis is what was diagnosed. And she, we text back and forth. Um, she knew it was uncurable, but my dad was real, my dad wanted to take her out to Scottsdale Hospital in uh, Arizona um, to get kind of a second opinion. Um, so she did. She went ahead and agreed. My dad drove her all the way out to Arizona, took 16 bottles of oxygen in the back. She didn't want to fly because she said, I want to be able to come back home and die. Um, she didn't fly, so he literally piled 16 bottles of O2, and she was on the last bottle when she arrived um, just to get her out there. Um, she got out there, and I kind of been capping toll on her. She'd been up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, still never actually heard her voice again. Um, other than the month before she was too short of breath to talk on the phone. So it was just text messages. Uh, at a certain point she said, Hey, I'm, they're going to put a breathing tube in me. I said, do you mean they're going to intubate you? You're going to be on a machine and, uh, text message said, yes, that's what they're going to do. I said, okay. Um, I'll check in with you after she goes, I'll check in with you after your surgery. Uh, so we're out, I'm out washing my truck one afternoon and, my son is in his room and I'm, I'm cleaning the wheel and my son comes out of his room. He's nine at this point. He goes, dad, I think there's a ghost in my room. And I was like, he didn't, I mean, I've done paranormal investigation for years, but I don't talk about it with my kids cause I don't want them thinking everything's a ghost. So he pause for a second. <clears throat> you just said you've done paranormal investigation for years. Ghost hunting for a long time. Yeah. You think I'm going to let that slide? <laughs> We're going to come back to this story about your mom. What the fuck are you talking about? So ghost hunting. Looking uh, from a scientific point of view, we've got a team. Uh, I haven't done it in probably four years, um, five years. Why the fuck was that not your initial email? Because <laughs> <laughs> delete, spam. Absolutely not. Um, if you would have put, I euthanize my mom and I'm a ghostbuster, that shit goes to the top of the inbox. Starred, important, flag with a fucking... Have you ever found a ghost? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. And the fuck you have. I know I have. I've been touched. Do I need to get a doll out so you can point it where? Appropriately. <laughs> I should say appropriately, not inappropriately. I've got some, you know, most of the stuff that is so strictly scientific. So we've got on our team, we had a Secret Service agent. We had a school teacher, um, a police officer, uh, me, medical professional. So a lot of very much, and a building inspector. These people turn their houses over to us. Hey, I think I've got, and they fill out this long questionnaire. You know, are you dabbling in this? Um, are you on any medications we need to talk about? Be very honest with this. Um, so they would turn our house over to us. And we go in and would, most of the time we debunk stuff. High levels of EMF, I guarantee you this room's full of a lot of EMF. Messes with your head at night when you're sleeping. Well, that's why Michael and I don't sleep in here. <laughs> well, alarm clock's next to your head. I don't have one of those. Good, you're safe. Yeah, Michael, do you have an alarm clock next to your head? My phone is not far off. Yeah, that's yeah. We'll measure that. Um, so high levels of EMF causes hallucinations. Um, okay. So we would we would do the inspection of these houses. And most of the stuff we debunk. Most of the stuff it's like that alarm clock just spiked at forty five milligauss. Well, anything above seven above messes with your head. I Get hate re- those milligausses. <laughs> milligausi. <laughs> milligausi. <laughs> milligausi. Um, so we debunk most of it. But I've been to some things that yeah, I've been to. We went to. A lady who swore she was not dabbling in things she shouldn't be. We get to her house. This is in Shawnee, Oklahoma, right? So Podunk, Oklahoma. And we're going through her house. We're finding Ouija boards. We're finding shit that you really shouldn't mess with. Um, and, and, and Why per- shouldn't you mess with the Ouija board? They say it's a portal to allow something in. Something very, very bad. Who says this? The ghost hunters. Okay. So you know, the make-believe people the make-believe. are saying make-believe shit? Yes, but you're telling me a Ouija board is a portal. To, okay, first of all, I don't I think I get just annihilated online for <laughs> pushing back on any of this. But it is. 
Yes, in theory. It, it is your best with something that allows maybe something in you don't want in. And this story gets kind of weird. All right. So, fuck. Yes. We're at this house. <laughs> we're, we're in the. And it's, we're finding shit in there. They're like, okay, you lied about that. You're like, and we're going to go through your medicine cabinets. Um, what are you doing, Michael? I don't know why that happened. I'll fix it. <laughs> I was going to say, holy shit, is this a ghost, ghost show? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. We're finding shit in the We're house. finding shit else that, yeah, okay, you didn't tell us about that. Um, and so we're sitting down. We have, all of us are wearing, like, my job is photography. Okay. So I would do open exposure for like four or five minutes, just leave the aperture open, try to capture something. Um, we all mic up. We're in digital recorders. Um, to see if we can catch an EVP, uh, electronic voice phenomenon. Um, to see if we can grab something. Um, I've been enough. I've been enough dead people, hospitals, and things like that. Weird shit happens in some of these places post death. All right. You're talking about in like the moments right after post death. Yeah. Um, many of our housekeepers they would not go in the room to clean up post death until you open a window. Like they were, they were hell bent on. We're not cleaning up that room till you open another window and let let whatever's in here is out of here. Um, I was not physically present when my mom passed. Mm -hmm. My sister and my dad were there, and apparently there was – she died in her bedroom. <clears throat> and I don't know exactly what was hanging from the ceiling, but there was something on the other side of the room that was hanging from the ceiling. No windows were open, and it started moving around. As she passed, it started moving as if the wind was blowing it. Interesting common narratives. Yeah. Energy leaving or whatever else. I mean, that – Fuck if I know. So we're in this house, and we're sitting upstairs in this great room, right? And we're looking – we're having a quiet time, which means let's just listen. Let's see if it kept any of the recordings. Um, you have to identify any noises you make. If you <clears throat> clear your throat, that shows up in other people's mics, and they're like, was that a ghost? No, that was, that was me clearing my throat. You know, if you fart, no, that's me. I did it. Um, so we're in this room, and our leader, Kristen, is looking across at uh, – what was his name? Corey, that's a police officer. And I'm looking at them and they start to like, they're they start to look really, really pissed off at each other. I'm like, what is going on here? I'm like, what the tension, you could feel the tension suddenly. Like, are they, are they, they're not couple, but are they, what's happening here? And Kristen, who's very well known in paranormal group, she was like, Hey, well, let's, let's stop. Let's stop and take a break. Something weird is happening. Something's not right here. They'll go outside and I accidentally take a bunch of pictures of this house. I'm like, God, I wish I still had the pictures, but I don't. Um, just ran, I actually hit the aperture, took a bunch of pictures, um, didn't realize I did. We're outside, and Kristen goes, hey, I, something's not right here. Something like my stomach's hurting really, really bad, and I'm getting really pissed off. Corey's like, I, yeah, I was fucking furious at you, and I don't know why. So Kristen calls Jason from TAPS. Um, if you do any ghost hunting, TAPS used to be a TV series years ago. Um, I, I don't do any ghost hunting. Just for <laughs> Maybe you should. Maybe it'll give you something to do. So far, based on what you told me, hard pass. <laughs> it gets even more fucked up, I assure you. <laughs> gets even more fucked up. All right, so he calls Jason because I think you're in a fucking demonic house. You need to get your team and go. Go, go. Don't go back in that house. Leave that house alone. Get out of there. So Chris was like, oh, oh, all right. So she goes, we're done. We're, we're packing up. We're not. We'll call the lady and say, yeah, we're, we think something demonic is happening in our house. Um, we need out of there. We're not staying there anymore. So we pack up everything else. And the next day I'm looking at my camera and I'm looking at back and those pictures are randomly shot. The house looks like it's on fire. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? It's the house looks like it, literally it's fully involved in flames. Weird, weird picture. Um, Kristen calls a guy named Alan Blyce, I believe his name was, world-renowned demonologist. And she's starting to describe everything to him. And he's like, you were in a demonic house, and good thing you left. Uh, so that night, I get home. Usually when we leave these houses, we tell them, hey, please don't follow us home. You are not welcome to come with us. This is your home. Stay here. We were just here to learn from you, so don't don't come home with us. That night, I get home, and it's about 2 in the morning. And I hear a simultaneous two knocks on every exterior door of my house. Like, and I'm thinking, I get up with a gun. I'm like, what the fuck? And I thought, fucking neighborhood kids, right? And I kept thinking, there is no way physically that someone could synchronize a knock on every external. The bedroom, the front door, and the back door of the back. And I thought, God damn it, they followed me home. Something came home with me. 
And I said, you are not welcome here. You need to leave here immediately. And I'm a little bit freaked out at this point, right? Because I'm like, what do you do? The ghost hunters aren't real, right? You can't call ghost hunters. If something attaches it to yourself that's that's not good, how do you get rid of them? You can't, you don't take a medicine for it. Are you asking me? Yeah. I don't have a fucking yeah. Let clue. me know. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was a little freaked out. Of course, I, at the time I was married, I, was, I didn't tell my wife. I was like, hey, yeah. So I think, because think, she's, she's through and through Mormon. So she would have flipped the fuck out. Oh, God, what did you bring home? Um, so a little bit later on, we decided to meet this lady. We were meeting her at IHOP, not at her house. We meet her in a neutral location. We hadn't seen her about a month and a half. We said, hey, we need to talk to you about your house. So we sit down with her, and we said, hey, how you doing? She goes, ah, things are kind of weird. She goes, I keep, my son's gotten really, really violent. And she goes, I keep having these, she loved her dog. She had this fluffy little rat dog. She goes, I keep having... <laughs> I keep having, I keep having, I want to tear this dog in half. I want to hurt this dog. And I look at Chris and she's pale. Like she's like, holy shit. Like so now you are firmly got a hold of something's in your house. And we said, oh, okay, uh, we think your house is possessed. You got a demonic possession. Um, you need to probably call some monks out or someone to come bless it. That's not us. We're, we're peace out. We're not doing this again. Um, but that was probably the weirdest interaction that I had that I was like, uh-uh. And really, I kind of backed off a little bit because, man, I don't need something following me. I mean, it, it came, whatever it was. Do you have crystals and shit in your house? No. Do you no. burn sage? No. <laughs> Do you throw, like, holy water against the doors and no. shit? No. Well, and I'm pretty well not very religious anymore, so now I'm, I'm kind of like, well. When right. did the uh, spirits touch you? We were in Lawton, right by a cemetery. And uh, we're sitting in the house, and I'm sitting against this couch, and we're sitting walking around and I'm finally relaxed and I feel fingers roll across the back of my neck and I'm like god damn drapes you know I'm feeling for hair or something does it again two fingers right across the back of my neck and I was thought okay all right something's here something literally just ran across temperature change in the room um that's kind of a thing on the paranormal side of the temperature drops the theory is that they need the energy to be able to do something Scott, I don't know what to make of these tales. <laughs> you need to experience it. Come out and do a ghost hunt. No. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you want to come do a ghost hunt? I'll do a ghost hunt with you. All right. Yeah. All right. Curly headed ginger <laughs> fuck over there. It's like, oh, yo, what on? <laughs> All right. So you believe in ghosts? I do. Whether they're out there spirits or whatever else, whether they're before and after, um, I don't think that How we. How do they just... fit into our, our system? Are we like? Are we existing as humans between heaven and hell? Is it a biblical thing? Like, how do you think this all plays out? So I think there's a pre-existence. Pre-existence. Yes. I think that. Like when you're in the balls. <laughs> pretty well, kind of, sort of, but literally not in a physical sense. Like you're kind of you're off. Or you're shot into space, if you know what I mean. Or something. <laughs> 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 or that. Okay. So I think as a pre-existence, I consider like these called, these are earth suits, right? This is the only way I've survived my career this long is I view our bodies as earth suits. It's the same thing behind if we can't survive in space without a space suit. Are you a fucking Scientologist? No, I am okay. not. I'm Thank God, no. no. It sounds like it is. <laughs> that sounds exactly like I'm a Scientologist, but I am not. Um, so this is our human flesh vehicle. Yeah. So okay. they don't last forever. They're hydraulic, pneumatic, electronic. Um, they don't last forever. The day we were born, we had a distance. The time timer started. Um, so I think there's preexistence. You acquire an earth suit, right? You wear it, you you run it in the ground, whatever else, whatever you want to do with it. But eventually, it's going to fail. It's like a used car. It goes to goes to a salvage lot. Mm -hmm. We go to the cemetery and we go to whatever's next. So there's several theories on parallel universes and the paranormal world. So like something's happening in a different. Basically, it's a different universe, and sometimes like the they, multiverse, kind of multiverse, yeah, or string theory. Okay, um, and sometimes they cross over, and we'll see something, and sometimes those those parallel universes will will cross into, and we'll see something just for a split second, and then it's gone. So you tell me, you've never felt a sense of something else being around you? I mean, there's an aspect that maybe I'm not really paying attention most of the time. Okay, uh, I don't think I've ever had like a paranormal experience. Okay. Do you believe in ghosts? Or do you think? I have a hard time believing in things that I can't objectively verify. I get that. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's outside of the realm of possibility. For me as a person, it's hard for me to wrap my head around things that 
and I don't discount people's beliefs by any stretch. Right. People, I when people tell me that they believe something, I think life is easier if you take people at their word. Sometimes mm -hmm. you're going to get conned and fooled, but for the most part, I think people, if you listen to them, they'll tell you what they believe. The fuck is it for me to say, "Hey, your belief is wrong." My personal belief system is is foundationally a little bit more in like touch, see, smell. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's why it's doing it from a scientific point of view is a little bit more thrilling versus a psychic. You know, I feel there's you know I don't I don't believe yeah. in that at all, but scientific point of view gets a little bit more. I guess real. It, it seems like it could point you in the direction, but again, at the end of that, is it proof? It's not, and that's the thing we're lacking is that we don't. There's not hard evidence, like. And I'm totally fine with that. You know, I, again, I'm not trying to judge in any way, shape, or form. For me, it's it's a tough one when I can't have some level of objective truth to it. That's why we debunk most of it. I'm like, yeah, you know, there's nothing here. Um, your house is creeping. So, what happened to that demonic house? Did they just went back in there well, and lived in that thing? I don't know. We never. We wanted nothing to do with it. Hopefully she called the monks from a local monastery to come out and bless it, but I don't know. We did not follow back up. Okay, so you found a portal to hell and didn't follow back up. That's yeah. probably awesome. a wise decision, right? <laughs> I mean, I would have gotten a goddamn fucking Ghostbuster suit on and get in that shit. Okay. Yeah. So All right. So what do you think happens after we die? Um Shit, I don't know. I wish I had answered that. I don't know if the lights go out. I'm hoping there's something else. I'm hoping that... I mean, you've been there at people's last moments. I have. Many times, but it's... it's I wish it was like <clears throat> the movies make it out to be, where it's peaceful or, you know, not horrendous. And that's, you know, I've heard stories, you've seen, you've heard stories of people crossing over and coming back. That it was the most peaceful thing. I don't know. That uh, also could be the body's natural... It, endocrine reaction yeah. to the end you know what i mean they might be totally being juiced up by their own internal chemicals or mm -hmm. who fucking knows maybe they went and knocked on the door and were like hey what's up dudes i'll be here later and came <laughs> i don't fucking know i hope it's not like groundhog day where i have to do this shit over because i don't really if i do can i please have the memory of the mistakes i made before because so i can do it right this time i just assume not get shot out of a vagina again and have to do this all over again i'd rather go on to the next yeah. whatever there is um, that's why I believe time, time is the most precious gift we can give anybody, hands down, because we, we can't make more time. In a time we were born, that Unless clock, we continue on after death and have unlimited amounts of time. But do we know that? I mean, that's, I don't know, after death, I've seen, like, a lot of people die, and I've seen, I was working in the yard ER one day, and I had a guy who crossed from me, um, I look up, and he codes, he goes straight into his history. I was like, oh, Jesus, I've got what up there. What did you go into? Flatline. Oh, okay. So, heart rate. Um, that was back when we did precordial thumps on the head, hard shot on the chest, and we did Fucking that. Fucking live. Yep. And believe it or not, it actually works. It's worked more than once for me, yeah. Marker. Um, I mean, it's an electronic stimulus. Exactly. You're just jumping that thing. Yep. Yep. And he wakes up, and he looks at me, and he goes, uh, are you Ed Tatum's son? And I was like, holy hell. He, I didn't know him. He didn't know me. And I'm a little freaked out. I'm like, what did you just see? Well, out of the blue, he asked if, I, my, if I'm my, son, my dad's son. Just after you died, you were dead for about probably 45, 45 seconds to a minute. So I get over there and get our leads on them. And, and I thought I was going to have to fibrillate them after I got them back. Uh, yeah. So were you know. wearing a name tag? No. Right. No, I learned that long ago. Just Took that shit off. Yeah, so I don't really. I wish it was more exciting when they juiced people with the. Uh... It's not. I mean, they, do sti they stiffen up for sure. Yep. Uh, oh God, how can I tell this story with keeping the. <laughs> the I was, rec I was <laughs> recently in the room where that happened, and so they put the person out for a little bit, and I was asking for a Sharpie to draw a dick on the forehead, <laughs> which I'm, I'll be honest, they were like, fuck, we need to find one. They couldn't find one. That's the only reason it didn't happen. <laughs> that is my, I woke up from surgery, my toenails planted, and I was like, you motherfucker. There are limited times to fuck with people in that situation, <laughs> and you need to carpe diem. Seize the fucking day mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. that comes up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Back to your mom. All right. And how dare you for try to slide in the fucking ghost hunting thing in the middle of <laughs> the middle fucking of a story. Deep like, story, yeah. but <laughs> it comes into play here. And, um, Fuck. <laughs> so Zach comes out, and I'm cleaning my wheel in the truck. And he goes, yeah, I think I heard a ghost in my room. I was like, well, that's weird. Um, I stop and go, well, what did it say? He goes, Zach, it's going to be okay. And I was like, God oh, damn it. My mom was in surgery at that point. Um and I thought, oh, Jesus, I'm thinking something happened, right? 
Um, I said, well, don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's maybe it was a dog bark. I don't know what to tell him, but I'm trying to process shit in my head. And he goes back inside. I wait, I wait for that phone call, right? Um, 10 minutes roll by, nothing. 15 minutes rolls by, nothing. 20 minutes rolls by, my dad calls. And he says, um, is I, hello? And it just kind of pause, right? Like he's trying to gather himself. And he says, your mom just coded in surgery. Um, and I'm like, that's what I firmly believe that's what Zach saw is he, she coded whatever reason, you know, um, he said they got her back, but she's on a vent and she's vent dependent, blood pressure dependent and machine dependent basically. So I said, okay. Uh, he said, when can you get out of here? I'll be out there next tomorrow morning. Um, go back inside and I'm like, here we are. Right. And we're at this point fly out to Arizona. My, aunt and my cousin my mom slash sister picked me up from the airport and they're telling me and i go to the hospital where she's at and uh i immediately meet with the icu doctor i'd flown many patients many balloon pump patients into um this guy uh so he knew who you were too. he knew i was yep he knew my skill set he knew everything else and he says hey let's take it takes me to the conference room he brings up your chest x-ray and I look at it, and I was like, Jesus Christ, her left lung is completely white. He goes, yeah, we're we're at the end of, there's nothing we can do at this point. I said, this is not what she wanted would be sitting on her machine. Um, I said, I promised her that I would never let her suffer. Um, he goes, what do you need? And um, I said, I needed some very loose orders, um, which means don't give me any parameters. Mm -hmm. Write them loosely. I said, I've... He goes, which medicines? I said, propofol, um, which is Michael Jackson's drug, milk of amnesia, probably what you got in surgery, white fluid. I don't know if it's commonly called the Michael Jackson drug, <laughs> just for clarity. <laughs> well, for the public who doesn't know what propofol is or dipping yeah. in. That is what um, ended up killing him, correct? Yeah, he got a little too much of it. Wasn't he, and again, I'm way out over my skis because this is shit I heard years ago. Wasn't he getting like nightly injections of that just to yeah. go to bed? Yeah. Fuck. Well, at, that's what you got in surgery. You probably high chance you had propofol dripping. So that's go why. Go back and look at the very robust bill that I got that <laughs> listed everything out. First, I didn't understand why they were barcoding everything. I thought it was just for an interaction perspective. Yeah, no. no. Well, it was for that too, but mm -hmm. it was also shishing, shishing, shishing. Yeah. So I'll go back and look. Well, Pro uh, propofol or propofol. dipping. Okay. Yep. Um, that and Versed, um, but usually get propofol because they can drip it in. Okay. So that's the reason why you didn't remember it. There was no memory. It's millions. I'm happy that I didn't. Yes. So I seen a propofol on fentanyl. I need a loose order of that. Um, he said, okay, you got it. And went to ICU. And I, I had not seen her since her mom's funeral a month before. Um, I go in there, walk in ICU, and she's on a vent. Um, she's swollen up a little bit, and I was like, oh, damn it. Okay, this is what we got to do. And it was like an immediate switch. Click. All right. Work mode. Mm-hmm. Sun mode, no more. Family member, no more. Work mode. And I get down in and I hold her hand and I said, okay, let's take her out of sedation. So just enough. Propofol, the half-life of propofol, it's just a couple minutes. And once you shut it off, you wake up. I didn't realize it was that short. Yeah, it's really short because really anybody who's on it in ICU, you have to break them out of it daily to kind of make sure you're not causing any damage. Um, okay. So you'll wake them up, pull them off it. I left her on just enough to where she wasn't gagging on her tube the breathing tube um pulled her out you know she opens her eyes and you know took a little bit to clear up you know kind of realized oh you're here um she looked miserable um we're talking kind of just simple talk and i i don't very simple talk um and finally reached a point i said you know this is it right and she shook her she nodded her head yeah i know um and I said, Dad, can I have some time alone with her? And I knew I needed to say something. And the only thing I could come up with was, I hope I've been a good son. And that, that was the gist of my final speech to my mom. Mm -hmm. I had nothing else. There was nothing. That was it. I hope I've been a good son. Because um, I'm still 15 steps ahead in what I'm about to do. All right? I'm, I'm in 100% work mode of the process of pushing her to the other side letting her go i had nothing i had that was not that loving son i didn't have that ability it was 
A or B. And I kept my promise to her. So told her that and she couldn't talk. Obviously she got a breathing tube. So I gave her a piece of paper to write stuff on. Um, uh, and she wrote, said, you and I will always be together forever. Um, and then right underneath that, she said, let's get this over with. And I'm like, the strongest, Jesus Christ, I, who, who says that? You know, who, who, who says, let's get this over with. I mean, other than it just, to me that she is by far the strongest, most powerful woman in the world with that statement alone. Hey, let's get this over with. I need you to, to make me go. Um, I said, it's not time yet. I said, you, you, we need to FaceTime your grandkids. Um, and you need to wave goodbye to them. Um, so I called up my kid's mom, uh, my wife at the time. And I said, hey, I need you to get the kids in the room. I said, um, Nana needs to, to wave goodbye. And the kids are bawling, you know, and then Nana's waving goodbye and, you know, blowing them kisses. And then I called my brother. And he was, he's a judge in New Mexico and he was in court. He goes, I've already said everything I would want to say to her. And I said, uh, okay. Um, so I sit down with her after this and I hold her hand and I said, this is what's going to happen. This is how this process is going to work. And I said, I'm going to put you back under deep, deep sedation. And, and um, you're going to wake up in your mom's arms. And that's how this is going to happen. My dad, with the most fucked up sense of humor known to mankind, he, he's out at the nurse's station. He comes in and he goes, hey, Sue, my mom's name is Susan. Hey, I just got to get good news. I'm like, what is going on here? And at this point, my aunt and my cousin are back in the room. He goes, um, I got a good deal on your cremation. <laughs> and I'm like, holy fuck. fuck She's yeah. still awake. And she she started and literally, my cousin goes, it's really not your problem after this, is it? She shook her head like, that's all fucking problem. you got to deal with this suit. That... But he literally walks in and goes, I got a good deal. And I thought, is that funny? Is that humor or what? I mean, okay, good on you. Um, so I said, leave the room one more time. So I told her, I said, are you sure you're ready to do this? And she nodded her head. I said, I'll see you when I see you. Um Took her under deep sedation of propofol, enough propofol to snow a horse, put a horse asleep, um, a fentanyl to snow a horse, and we shut off all their blood pressure medications to keep her blood pressure up. And she got stuck. She got stuck between here and there with a blood pressure of 40 over 20, um, which is nothing. I mean, yeah. your, your blood pressure is probably 130 over, under pain of my coffees you've had. Um, One a day is what I'm limiting myself to. One. First, when we first opened the shop, I'm like, why the fuck can't I sleep at night? Like, oh, <laughs> it's a coffee. I'm drinking coffee until 5 p.m. every mm -hmm. day. One a day, no more before noon. Sleeping way better. Smart man. <laughs> Smart man. But she's stuck at 40 over 20. She, and I'm like, oh, dang it. Oh, I'm not keeping my promise to her. Um, what can I do to, to increase this? I go over to the ventilator and I dial down the oxygen. I dial, start dialing that down. Well, he didn't write orders for me to fuck with the vent. I didn't know that the vent directly injects the changes into the the nurse's station out there. And a nurse comes in and goes, what are you doing? I said, she's stuck. I said, we either need to extubate her or we need to do something. I said, call the doctor. So the doctor comes back in. I said, we need to we need to pull the tube. Um, told my family, my dad and two others, y'all might want to leave the room for this. It's kind of gross when we pull the tube. Um, sometimes gunk comes out with it or whatever else. So pulled the tube, and then she started in the guppy breathing. Um, she couldn't maintain her airway anymore. Um, and that sped it up. She'd probably pass within about 30 minutes after that. Um, after she had passed, it was like I still was not emotional. I had, I had no emotion. I was like, okay. Um, I kept my promise to her. Uh, in order, to me, that is by far, everything had to kind of happen in, for a reason at the right time. The only time you give someone propofol is if they're going to be on a ventilator or somewhere that you can control the airway because usually they can't control the airway anymore. Um, so she had to code in. And the weird part about surgery is if your DNR do not resuscitate, that's usually withdrawn for surgery. They won't do surgery on you without. So they'll code you in surgery. Um, 
At least it used to be that way. So she coded. She got on a ventilator. She got put on propofol, which you just recently having surgery. No, you didn't remember anything. Mm. So what better way to be on a breathing machine than if you have got no memory? What better way to allow our loved ones to pass than that? Heavy dose of fentanyl and propofol um, in a controlled environment. That is by far the most peaceful, humane way that you can go. Why do you think she gets stuck? Uh, just physiological, brainstem function. Yeah. Brainstem function. The body didn't want to die. The body do. really does not want to nope. die. Um, brainstem function only, and that's that's the heart is the only muscle in the body that can self generate a, a pulse, a beat, self contract. Um, SA node and AV nodes, it can contract different parts of your heart. So she was just stuck, and because she was still getting oxygen through the vent, allowed her to get stuck. Um, she passed, we got down, and I remember going back out to the car and going through her purse because my dad needed her driver's license, and it just hit me at that point that, holy shit, we can't take any of this with us. Like, all her pur- her tissues are in there, um, her wallet, and I knew that in the past, that we don't can't take any of these things with us, but it hit me that this is her purse, and it's not with her anymore. She, she's gone. Um, I didn't realize all this came at a cost. Um, the cost is I have no memory of my mom anymore. I got nothing left. Um, because of the profession, what has it done to us? Is anything traumatic? I put it in the fall academy, lock it away. The windshield wiper method. It put it away. I've got, through EMDR, I've got no memories of my mom past that day. None. I look at pictures. I hear stories from my brother. I don't remember that. Um, it is a big blank spot. Um, even after you know, it's so much therapy, it won't come to. I start to see it, and it disappears. And I don't know how to to re grab those memories because I would love to talk about mom, stories about mom. I got nothing other than what I had to do for her. Even the Christmas right before, nothing. I don't even remember her that my mom at her mom's funeral. How long have you been working at it? Seven years. How consistently? Um, not as consistent I like because a lot of it's cost. I mean, counseling costs a significant amount of money. And I'm no expert by any stretch. <clears throat> as long as you are continuing to work in a setting where you're providing medical aid to people and you readily have to access that space where you can put things aside without dealing with them, it might not be possible. Huh. You might have to move on in your life professionally before you're actually able to access that filing cabinet. Because, because you keep going back into a place where you have to add material to it. And it's just getting stacked up against it and everything else you can't. I don't know about any of that, but it's a place in your brain that you still need. Okay. Because you're professionally still putting yourself into right. that place. Maybe it's something that you can't access until you're your mind and fucking knows how I bet you we know less about how our brain works than how it actually does oh we do we it's, always like to act like we're the smartest fucking you know top of the anthill yeah of retards you yeah. know like <laughs> yeah yeah I mean you still need that filing cabinet right now yeah it doesn't from a, somebody with no expertise whatsoever it doesn't seem to me to be implausible that until you get to a place where it's not needed it may not be open and available to you yeah, it's past. Yeah, it's literally vault password protected. I think you're right. You know, and I had not thought about because I'm still in that mode or that protection mode. And ba- I mean, I'm not very rarely knock on wood to our operators go down with anything, but I've treated several gunshot wounds. And um, it's not even the fact that whether they get hurt or not, you are mentally at a place where you are prepared for it. Mm-hmm. So you still have that bifurcation between your personal life and your professional life. Right. You know, that the question you ask is who writes something like, let's get this over with? I know the answer to that because my mom got to a place with her cancer um, where my sister corrected me on this recently. I thought she had died of non-smoker's lung cancer. It wasn't that. It was cervical cancer that had metastasized into her lungs because she was a cervical cancer survivor. She had gone through the whole nine, the hysterectomy, chemo, which, holy fuck, you want yeah. to talk about yeah. eating nails. She got to a place where she denied the chemo and accepted hospice. Uh-huh. 
She never verbalized, let's get this over with, but you know what it means when you're going into hospice. She knew that either the chemo was going to kill her or the cancer was going to kill her. Yeah. And it, uh, the person that says that is somebody who realizes that their choices are no longer good, that they're choosing between bad and bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah, metric it's- of... It's not a metric of the choices that they have in front of them. It's a metric of the suffering that they're staring down the barrel of. So, I mean, I get it. It's, but who else in this world, other than prison inmates who are going to get the lethal injection, who else knows exactly when and how they're going to die? Like, nobody. you're, you're going to die in, in 20 minutes, and this is how. Um, I am? Do I? Did the spirit tell you that? You ghost hunting fuck? <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, she should have gone 20 minutes, but yeah. she fucking hell on. Nobody knows when they're going to die. Yeah. But she did. She knew I, this is how you're going to go. Who else gets that? Um, and still be like, let's do this. Uh, well, you have to look at it through the potential of what she was seeing in her eyes. She's in a bed. She's smoked. I'm going to assume that your mother was a intelligent woman. So she knew mm-hmm. like the, the jury is out on whether or not smoking is a vitamin or mineral. You know what I mean? It's right, not like eating right. your greens. I honestly, I cannot believe in the modern era that people still smoke. I know, right? Yeah. It's like, guys, a, a while ago, we directly tied the end state to this. Yeah. So, yeah. but again, people live their life however you want to. She knew what had gotten her there. She mm-hmm. knew where she was. She, and you guys had already had the conversation. The next thing you know, she's sitting, you're sitting at the hospital bed next to her. Yeah. I mean, it probably was easier because it was something that she had already thought herself, thought that she had already thought through and communicated with you. Yeah, and she had plenty of time to lay there and go, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't, you know, and that's, she had that ability to, to, you're right, to process through this, I'm done. Like, I'm tapping out. I'm it. Um, Yeah, it's just not have the ability if I had to do it all over again I still keep my promise to her mm-hmm. but god I would love to have been just been her son you know maybe had a better speech or something or be able to I've been in the headspace you're in <clears throat> and I still struggle with this uh, my mom passed I think it was like seven to ten days after I got back from being overseas I was in a very binary place very black and white action reaction death was on the menu daily yeah um and i got back from overseas and it was quick and she was into hospice and i was not there when my mom passed i had left a few days before to go back to san diego but the last thing i did was give my mom a hug and tell her that i loved her and as i was laying her back down she said hey can you hand me the garbage can i need to throw up those were my mom's last words to me and i struggled with that because i didn't have a grandiose speech i didn't have anything written down that I knew what I should say. I didn't know what to say. Right. Yeah, I, I you know, didn't either. The most kind thing up until that point I had done to somebody dying is put another fucking five, five, six round through their face to right. ease them along in their path. Like, Hey, you look like you're struggling. Let me help you out. Um, and I forget who brought this up to me, but it helped. Um, my mom knows who I was. She raised me. We had a lot of good conversations throughout her life. She knew who I was as a person, as a boy, as a man, and she knows what I felt about her. Right. And so did your mom. Just because it wasn't perfect in that moment doesn't mean that your mom didn't know who you were. As a matter of fact, she probably knew who you were better than anybody else on earth. True. Very true. Yeah. Can you, you know, I don't think... I try to put this in the context. If can anybody do both? Can you be the son and the can the if if you're involved, let's say that you're with your kids and you're a shooting kicks off at a, at a movie theater or whatever else, and people are dying, your kids are scared to death. Would you have the ability to comfort them in that period of time, or Not would you go? Moment. You have to address the threat first. So you wouldn't have. You'd have to go to work mode. You go to work mode, and then. In that situation, it's not time for comfort. In the movie theater scenario, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not time to comfort anybody. You comfort them after. You have to end the scenario first. Okay, makes sense. You know? Yep. 
the setting that you're talking about, I mean, there's another way that you can look at this. <clears throat> Think about how few mothers and sons have the opportunity to share that final moment in a controlled mm -hmm. setting yeah. where she probably felt no pain whatsoever. And None. Physiologically, yes, her body got stuck. And I've, one of the things I hate about the movies, among many things, is they make death seem to be this peaceful peaceful event and I the, like you're saying the guppy breathing the twitching the, the violent jerking reactions that you've seen from people that you know are clearly dead that makes you think that they're still alive it's fucking weird yeah it is it's fucking weird it is you had the ability to be there for your mom at the end when she needed you how many people can say that I wasn't there for my mom I wasn't That's able true. to do shit for my mom other than try to give her a hug and like choke the words out that I love you. Yeah. Well, very good point. Yeah. You're right. Not many do. And almost uh, nobody does. Often people just get that phone call. She's gone or yep. whatever. Um, and I'm thankful that she trusted me to, she knew that I had her back, you know, and that's what I fall back on to is that I got you. Um, I, I will not let you suffer. Things had to happen exactly perfectly for me to do it legally, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it's exactly like it should have happened for me to keep a promise to her. Um, I just wish it didn't come with the price that it did. And I think you're right. I think once I release from this profession and don't have to stay kind of on that guard all the time, maybe then that other door will open up because um, I can't. It won't open. And I wish someone had told me early in the career that, and I feel sorry for those people who have to work on their own, you know, run on their own kids, whatever else, or family or spouses. Kids on their own yeah. kids. Um, I cannot even, I cannot even fathom um, that. I got put on standby for a pediatric drowning in my neighborhood, and I was 99% sure it was my son. I didn't tell anybody else. Um, I didn't know it wasn't my son until I looked in the back of the ambulance. But in my mind, all the way up to that point, I wrote down all his drug dosages on my thigh because I knew I couldn't look into his eyes and make my calculations because in pediatrics it's weight based. I knew I would have the not have the ability to make accurate calculations looking in my son's dead eyes. How uh, hard for you is it to round that corner and look into the ambulance? Uh it was scared. It was I I don't remember I mean like that guy shooter. I don't remember my leg. I don't remember walking. I remember taking the last deep breath. I didn't tell anybody else in the aircraft that I thought it was my son because I kind of needed someone to be of sound mind. Not, oh, God, this is Scott's son. Looked in the back, but your mind doesn't disengage immediately. I looked in the back on, it's not my son, but my mind's still going. It's because it's the exact same size. We got all the information that we needed from him. Um, that didn't save him. We worked, took him inside the yard and worked him for an hour and a half and never got him back. Watched the mom, watched me work him, thinking that's where I was going to sit, watch him work. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, I just feel sorry, though. I can't even fathom, but. I don't think, I think you're right. I think I have to release once I leave this profession. That's when maybe it'll open up. I mean, I think the things that are lost can be found. It's just a matter of how hard you want to look for them. There's no yeah. way that your mind has erased no. your mother. No. And if we can agree upon that, then the only question is the how. The why is easy. Yeah. Why do you want to recover these things? If you can determine your why and it's powerful enough, the how is the only thing you have to dis you know discover what you want to do. And it's not that – I don't want to use the term saying it's not that hard because it's – I don't want to be trite in any way, shape, or form or make it seem like it's going to be easy. Yeah. But you can find things that have been lost. I mean, what would you – What would if you could go back and redo that situation, what would you change? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, I took her out the vent immediately make her go quicker than having to get stuck there. But I think it was, like you said, physiologically stuff, probably not psychologically stuck. So no, it was, you know it was I mean? all physiological. It was yeah. just a body's response, not wanting to go. Um, yeah, I just think people and in, in really your profession and mine, we don't, it comes with a cost that people don't necessarily tell us what it does to us. Do we get, become hardened? Absolutely. We do. I had to, um, I couldn't work back to back to back in Arizona. We'd, at one point, I ran four pediatric drownings in one day. Um, yeah, flew out four. The pools, you know, all the pools. So I just feel like that's an ungodly number in one day. 
lot of swimming pools. We used to joke that we we're going to have a water water crash in Arizona because it's going to be in a pool. I'm going to have to eat grass and aircraft because it's going to be in a pool. I mean, would you guys just land the Hilo like in the mm-hmm. you know, in the street out yep. front? Close second. Yep. Fuck. Or in a nearby parking lot where the, yeah, the ambulance Hilo. bring it to us. Okay. Yeah, that's the only time I've ever been defibrillated. When I've been shocked was pulling a kid out of a pool and Phoenix fired a defibrillator and we were all soaked with water in the pool and we got the juice at the same time the child did. But um, We had, they issued us AEDs. This mm-hmm. is how smart the people are that I used to work with. We tried to shock each other. Thank God. <laughs> it doesn't they activate a non-shockable rhythm. And you're like, yeah. fucking. <laughs> God damn it, shock. This fucking new guy, you're going to pay. <laughs> they're just like, ah, fuck. It won't yeah. go off. That poor new guy's like, is it going to happen? Is it going to? I feel like we would have killed the person. Um, I'm really happy it didn't go off. Uh, this is, of course, hypothetical and allegedly, but, you know. <laughs> There's a high chance it probably would have put them in a there rhythm. There were times where they would issue us stuff and then take them back. Tasers is another one. Yeah. I get that. So we gave you guys 100 cartridges, and there's three left. It's been one week. <laughs> what's going on? Why is everybody twitching every time we... What, so what's going on? I'm like, nothing. <laughs> Give us those back. <laughs> Why do you have blood spots in the back of your shirt? I don't I mean, know. What, are, what are fucking new guys even for, you know? That's what they're for. <laughs> I used to send people, new people into. I go, hey, would you take the vitals in that patient in ICU? No, and they've been dead for t- two hours. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yes. That is what I'm talking about. They go and come out going, can I help? I go, what? Yeah. Did you kill him? What? Yeah, I'd fuck with them all the time. Do you think your occupation made you a better person or a damaged person? Um, gosh. A little bit of both. I mean, my kids' boo-boos, it better be significant for me to be somewhat worried about your boo-boo. Um, a little bit of both. Um. My kids stress my medical knowledge through and through, and my whole family does. They're always calling me. Um, but the flip side is, yeah, your boo-boos are not, that's not a boo-boo to me. So, Do you value your time more? Yes, because I know the, the next fight. Passion fi- or zest for life perhaps a little bit brighter than some because you see so often people passing over. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like It changes your life in ways that it is easy to view your exposure to the things that you have experienced you know mm-hmm. the fact that you don't remember much of the details in the what was it 649 mm-hmm. Elo fights imagine the other side of that coin though and the impact that you had on those people's lives that you were able to get them from point a to point b to that higher level of care like it the fact that you can't remember it is the cost that you have to bear from that but imagine how important you are in that person's life and it's so easy to focus on or would be easy to focus on that you can't remember your mom right now, where you realize or recognize that there's that filing cabinet, which I actually think is very important that you can realize and recognize that because you're going to be able to lockpick yourself into that at some point in time. Yeah. But it can give you a different perspective on life. They can give you joy in the simpler things and the value for time. You know, the boo-boo thing is, is real. Like it, you can actually turn your kids into a little bit more of a resilient machine if you don't like <laughs> call 911 if they stub their toe. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of positive changes that can come from your experience. Like that doesn't mean you should ignore any of the negative ones, which it doesn't sound like you were doing. But a lot of the times most of the energy and effort and focus is on the the shadow as opposed to the light that is on the other side of that. And I have embraced more of that the the further along I've got, you know, like I'll, I would go into Walmart and I would see someone I flew out. They don't remember me, but I'm seeing with their family. And I'm like, that's why I do this. You know, you got more Christmases with them. You don't remember me, um, which is fine. I'll never go, hey, I flew you out. But I very much remember your face and your injuries and everything else. Um, that's the nice part. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's I get to make a difference in people's lives. Um now I teach people how to make a difference, mm-hmm. which is almost as fulfilling because especially when I hear back, hey, I just, you know, I saved a life today. I put on a two tourniquets or whatever else. And I'm like, yes, you know, everything I've taught, see it do, see one do one, teach one, you're doing that. Thank you. Um, that's the reason why I do what I do. Most of, most of my work now is teaching. Um, you know, if we get a call out to whatever else, I'm the only bomb the only, well, two medics attached to the bomb squad. 
those are my most worrisome calls because it's going to go bad. It's going to go really bad. Yeah. Um, but I teach all my all my guys know how to take care of themselves. They know how to take care of kids. And my son can put on a tourniquet faster than anybody else than I've ever seen. So we got to experience that. Um, that's the making difference that you talked about. So. So it seems like you've made a difference in countless people's lives. I hope so. When are you going to focus on making a difference in yours? I'm pretty well doing it slowly right now. You're going to have to put down the job. Yeah, but I don't. I don't know what to do after that. I, I, it's, That's okay. It's a. But you don't that, have to that have is a leap like of step A to B to C to D for your entire life. Yeah, I feel like you've probably hit some retirement thresholds in some of these occupations you've had. Yeah, I think I would let go of the tack team and bomb squad. Yeah. Um, because that's just volunteer. I don't get paid for that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the part that is hanging over me. Um, the teaching for CBP, I'm not doing medicine. I'm just strictly teaching. Yeah. Maybe backing off, not cold turkeying it. Um, maybe. Because right. I think I'll miss the camaraderie. I've been with these guys for eight years. It's not the only place you can find camaraderie. And they trust me. If you were diagnosing a patient that had the same symptoms that you are describing to me, mm -hmm. what would you tell them to do? And you thought oh, that that was the linchpin that was holding them back. The same thing. You're going to have to leave the, the profession. but It's easier to say to somebody else, right? Yeah. It's, it's and losing, I'm not trying it's, to talk you out of leaving that profession. You've made such an impact in other people's lives that you deserve to be the person that you want to be. To do that, I think you're going to have to access that portion of the filing cabinet that's all the way in the back that you don't want to. Yeah. The only way to do that is to release the, the gatekeeper. You also mentioned that there's a financial aspect to that. I guarantee you that there either is internal to your organization or foundations out there that will cover the entire cost of that. There has to be. And for anybody yeah. who listens to this or are, are aware of those, fucking email me the details and I will send them to you via third party. Okay. There are countless service-based organizations that have so much money that are designed to do exactly these things. Like there's a way. Yeah. And that's what, I mean, I'd be open. I'd be open to it, you know, because it's, it's time to, it is time. Um, I've tried to move on before, but. Like I said, it's all I know. It's very, it comes very easy for me. And the financial side, yeah. I mean, it's, I need the income, right? But, yeah. I get that. Price versus cost. Mm hmm And they are distinctly different. They are. Yeah, I just, it's okay to reinvent yourself. I would say do it slowly over time. You don't have to fucking jump off the Grand Canyon and figure it out, like how to craft a parachute on the way down. <laughs> I'm not advocating anybody do that, but... There are other ways to make a living. The teach, and you know, that I think teaching would keep you in that world, but you know you're not going to have to be responding and having to switch over into that clinical perspective where the right. filing cabinet then comes back to the forefront so you can put that in there and shovel it away so you can go back to your family or teaching or whatever it may be. I know that there are, I know that there are people, places, and organizations out there that would bend over backwards to help you arrive at that spot. Well, I would... Uh Take it and then pass it on to other people who I call say, us. What, what, uh, what advice would you give to somebody who wanted to follow in the similar vein or career path that you did? I mean, now beyond, you know, I asked you what you would do differently if it uh, with the situation with your mom, but how about occupationally, knowing that this filing cabinet exists, knowing that these things are there, what advice would you give to somebody who's on the, you know, they're looking at this career on the horizon, it's something they want to do? You know, we jokingly say deal with your demons. I mean, that's... But it's legit. You need to deal with them. Don't let them, the cumulative trauma thing that stacks and stacks and stacks, don't let it stack until the stack is so high that you, now it's overwhelming to you. Um, maybe if I had processed, I don't know, that's a hard one. Because if, if I had to deeply process each one of those, then it becomes personal. And then it's like, oh, God dang it. Um, sometimes I wouldn't follow up with a patient because I don't really want to know what happened. Yeah. They were alive when I dropped them off. We're good. You know? Um, well, that is also all that you had control of as well. Yeah. You know, the, for the brief moments in time that you were with these people, that's the only thing that you have control over. You didn't cause the reason that you were alerted and sent to that location, and you have zero control over what happens when they leave your care. 
not that you shouldn't care, but I think you should deeply care about, you know, obviously your time with them, which I can tell you absolutely do. I don't know how much is gained by focusing on the tail end of that, you know? I've done it a couple times, and then I immediately went back thinking, what could I have done different? Was it on my was it my fault I didn't live? Did I leave out a process and not resuscitate? So then I go back into, fuck, what could I have done? Was it my fault? So I, I learned to just don't follow up. Just don't, because you'll beat yourself up. I mean, it's, was it my fault? Could I have done something? Yeah, that's real. I think you should go full time into ghost hunting. <laughs> I should. I should. I don't know if there's a lot of money in that. Did the demonic lady pay you? No, nobody pays us. It's just free. It's a hobby. Is it free though? Is it a hobby? No, it's not a hobby. <laughs> well, right. kind of. Pickleball is a hobby. Is it? it? Depends on who you ask. But <laughs> <laughs> I immediately go to a nursing home. Pickleball. Maybe. All right. I'm gonna need to hook you up with my buddy Jack Osborne. He does fucking. Yeah, what did you paranormal TV shit? Okay, I don't know if he actually believes in ghosts. I think he might just get really large checks from the network. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with either, to be honest. Well, I've our morgue, the place I worked at, I'm not gonna give it a name, but we had 300 bodies down in the morgue at any given time. At any given time, that's a lot of room. It's a huge room. It's a huge freezer. Yeah, um, literally go in there and yeah, there's 300. So yeah, it's uh. We would, the mortician was quite the unique guy. It's a teaching place, but he would have to just articulate bodies and he would call me frequently. This kind of goes back to the ghosts. And I'm like, okay. I, some of the Native Americans believe that the way the body is left at the death is how they're stuck for an eternity. And I'm thinking, oh shit, because the whole body gets disarticulated yeah. so that it can be used for ortho and neuro and. Who wants to be a mortician when they're growing up? I don't. You always have business. Yeah. I mean, so does the person who prepares bodies for funerals, but I, fuck me. Like, I don't know if I would want to deal with that day in and day out. And it's kind of a corrupt business. I mean, you're the, the funeral business. Oh, Jesus. They're trying to upsell Tell you. Tell me on, more. They, how many times? So they're going to want to upsell you on caskets. Uh, I've got a good friend who's a mortician who got out of it and worked, went to work for a, a teaching hospital just in body preparing. But he hated it. He was like, he was pressured to upsell the airtight casket. What a motherfucker. Yeah. I go back to the Big Lebowski. What it, was it? It was a Folgers can that they had. <laughs> yeah. <body>. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Have you at least seen that one, Michael? Moving on. Mother next, next question. Fucker. <laughs> he hasn't seen the A team. I've so, so many times he's gone. I don't, I haven't seen that. And I, yeah. You truly have not seen the Big Lebowski. No, I've heard so many good things about it. They put Donnie I mean, in a fucking Folgers. <laughs> it, what does the guy say? He goes, "It's our most economically affordable receptacle, or some shit like that." So they go to a supermarket and dump out a fucking big like red coffee, <laughs> dump it into the wind, and it comes right back on their face. It's yeah, fucking Donnie. <laughs> What do, what do we do with our I kids? don't really know. Um, I don't know. What, what was is this? the last movie you watched? Uh, I think Hereditary. Fuck, I haven't even heard of it. It's a horror movie. It's actually pretty good. Hereditary. Yeah. I've not heard of that. At least he likes older music. I mean, I'll give yeah. him that much. That is spanned. Define older. <sighs> Pearl Jam. I like Pearl Sound Jam. Garden. Yep. Right. Even older than that, I like, too. Linkin Park. Yeah. Def Leppard. Uh, not as much. Like, I like some of their songs. Sabbath? Oh, I love Black Sabbath. ACDC? Yeah. Zeppelin. Okay. Oh, okay. shit, Zeppelin. Now we're, we're knocking it back a bit. All right. Yeah, it's like, what, late 60s? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Motherfucker, I haven't See? seen Big Lebowski. <laughs> I, d I keep saying that I need to do this, but I need to start a, like, a homework list of shit so he at least understands the references that I'm making. And then quiz him. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Fuck. How old are you now? 53. All right. I mean, what's next? Yeah, I don't know. Happiness. Um, watch my kids grow up a little bit more. Um, I'm happily divorced, so that's that's a huge relief. Um, got a How long have you been divorced? A year and a half. How long were you married? 28 years. Okay. 
Mine was one of the longer ones. I was married for 19 years and 11 months. Yeah, it was It was a good, it was time to go. Uh, amicable? Yeah, very much. Okay. Extremely. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Although she got married within less than a year after a divorce. The ink wouldn't even dry yet, but as long as she's happy, it's all that matters. Here's the thing, though. Who cares? I don't I, care. You know what I mean? Like, but a lot of people would hang their hat on that. Oh, it's, you know, this side of that. Like, let the other fucking person live their life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's, And that's where I'm at. So yeah. If she's happy, then then that makes the life around the kids a little bit happy. Yeah. Or There are also some people that have to have somebody else in their life to be happy. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's, I mean, there's a lot of variables. People are a mixed bag for sure. All right. You got time. Maybe, unless we get fucking T-boned in the and that's traffic on the next here. The next five minutes aren't guaranteed. That's yeah. how I tell everybody. I said, no, well, it's... Well, how long are you guys in Montana for? Uh, till Monday. Okay. What are you guys going to do? I don't know. What is there to do? I see mountains, but I... Well, tomorrow, there's going to be nothing to do, except watch the tumbleweeds go down Main Street, because I swear to God, this town absolutely <laughs> shuts down on a Sunday. Um, I'd go get some good food. I'd hit either the Mercantile Grill or DeSoto. You got any other recommendations, Michael? Maybe Jalisco's up in Whitefish? Jalisco's. In Lakeside, there's Tamarack, which I'm going to this Sunday, actually. Are you going by yourself? Yeah. Michael's newly in love. He's just asked for, that was a, there was he a, asked pause. for a maiden's hand in love. <laughs> Is this a male or female? You're not going... <laughs> Yeah, you have to ask him. I can't. I don't want to assume anything. Not sure yet. <laughs> you wait. What say? Michael. You're not sure yet. <laughs> I take it you're not going by yourself then. No, I'm not. That's what I figured. Yeah, that He's smitten. But that, the tamarack that is really good though. Tamarack. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The best restaurant in Flathead used to be right by the tamarack. It was the. Uh, it's a breakfast place. God damn it! I would have been able to call. The, uh, the farmhouse, but it closed down. Holy shit, they had a breakfast menu that was to die for. Did COVID kill them? No, it was before that, actually. And I, the same lady, they, uh, the Bear Grass Bistro is a dinner place. Expensive. Very good, though. It was the same owner. She owned the farmhouse, and it was awesome. And we talked to her, and, you know, it was interesting. She said that, actually, the customers were such fucking assholes. <laughs> that and know. staffing issues, but the combination of those two things and people just being complete and utter cunts. That it just wasn't worth it anymore. Up in this area, yeah. I just figure people a bit more. Why would you down feel? down homely nice country folk? I mean, they're still hillbilly assholes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, we got all the same shit that everybody else does, maybe to a smaller degree. But okay. I think probably statistically, it's the same. You just draw it a little bit back more towards the origin. But yeah, so those are some good food options, and that'll take you all the way from Lakeside to Whitefish, which is everything you're going to see from the base of the mountains down to the north end of the lake. Actually, a little bit south of the north end of the lake. Okay. Michael, do you have any part of the park is still open? Even in the winter, you can go out to like Lake McDonald. Yeah, right? I think you can go. I think it's like $30. I would I would say cruise into the park, Glacier National Park, for as much as you can see with the snow. Do you need a four-wheel drive? I, just, I rendered it. No, it's Camry. Should, you shouldn't need to. Okay. Camrys are four-wheel drive, though. I don't know if you knew that. They're off-road vehicles, <laughs> especially if they're rented. <laughs> Just make sure you get the insurance. I've actually, uh, yeah. for about a year, Hertz wouldn't loan me or rent me any cars because <laughs> I would jump four horses, <laughs> allegedly. Um, yeah, so the the park would be good. What else, Michael? You've been living here longer than I have. Yeah, the park. Um, there's lots of little trails off the park, but it's pretty snowy right now. So Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean. Just going to enjoy the scenery. This is... I was going to say, that'll fill up your time. You guys leave what time on Monday? Noon. Oh, yeah. So you'll, yeah, between that stuff, that should fill you okay. pretty good. Yeah. It's beautiful up here. Wow. It's not bad. You know, there's a lot of, there's worse places that you could live. Yes. For sure. Yes. I told her, I said, this may be a one-way trip. You wouldn't be the first person that has said something like that. What is tough is, you know, during COVID, the influx of people was certainly real. And what that did to the curve of the values of real estate, uh, it rapidly outstripped it. what people living here, making a wage here could actually afford. And then the cost of money being what it is right now, fucking good luck getting a, I mean, not the good luck getting a loan, but the interest rate you're going to pay on it. Holy shit. What Bad. the payment's going to be yeah. per month. So it's beautiful, but it's not. So COVID did that to y'all up here. It did that. To a lot of places, yeah. A lot of the places where people didn't want to be, this is one of the places where they did, whether it be the the perceived or real freedoms that they thought they would have in the state. And I will say there were many more in comparison to a lot of the more totalitarian states. Like, that was real for sure. Yeah. But, you know, the cost of living up here is now higher than what it used to be, and the median income is about the same. 
Okay. So you got that huge gap. Yeah. It's not okay. It, it kind of crushes the locals. So. All right. I guess we'll not come yet. What do you want to close it out with? Um, Did we not cover anything you wanted to? Excuse me. Bless you. I think we covered a lot. We covered most everything that I could. Can't think of anything else. I mean, it's. How it's, can people get a hold of you? Uh, they can email me. So, Heli. Be careful with what you say next. Well, I can, <laughs> I can blop and block and spam the shit out of any. All right. So, Heli Rescue, as in helicopter911 at gmail.com. Okay. Somebody right now who works in the same industry that you are in is fucking pissed that you stole that. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it for a long time. They okay. can't have it. All right. Yeah. You know, questions, email me. That's, I teach all over. So, teach Triple C, tech, instructor, PHTLS, you name it. I, there's about 23 certifications I maintain. All right. So, Well, I appreciate you taking the time, and I appreciate you being so open and honest about your experience. Not a problem. I said, if it helps others, that's why I'm here. That's what I've told you. And it's... If people know, okay, I'm not the only one this is happening to. I don't know if I, maybe I am. Fuck, I don't know. You are 100% not. Okay, good. And I don't worry about the people who can talk about it. I worry about the <laughs> ones who think that they're the only ones and think that nobody can understand what they're going through and think that they have nobody to talk to. Those are the ones I worry about. Yeah, and then they go dark, dark places. and They go dark, dark places and they start making decisions that cannot be unwound. Because once the acorn hits the cop that cop car, you know what I mean? <laughs> Fucking rounds ain't going back you in dump the gun. Your, you dump your mag into... You, you know what? We started and stopped with the fucking acorn. Florida acorn cop. Thank you very much, Scott. You're very welcome. <laughs>